a loving husband and father with so much to live for. He did everything for his family. He was an amazing daddy. He loved life. He loved to be happy. Is ruthlessly gunned down at home in front of his wife. When he was laying there on the floor, nothing can prepare you for that. They stood over the victim's body with a shotgun and delivered a fatal blow. This wasn't just a random killing. This was an assassination. Police tracked down several suspects. She was absolutely the possible person who was involved. She had all the motive. He began bragging about other involvements that he had had with acts of violence. And we knew that he and the victim had some bad blood between them. Just when police think they might never catch the killer. We were pretty frustrated, and the wind was kind of taken out of our sails. The case takes a mind-blowing turn. She sang like a songbird. He had been in possession of the guns used. And law enforcement was pretty stunned by that. To reveal a killer no one imagined. This is unbelievable. It was someone that if you passed on the street would look as innocent as they come. The darkest, blackest soul. Known for its white sand beaches, Panama City lies on the Gulf Coast of Florida's Panhandle. Our biggest industry is uh, tourism, with uh, millions of people coming to enjoy the Gulf Coast. The community is very tight. You know most of your neighbors, you know everybody that you do business with on a personal name basis. But in the early hours of October 6, 1998, the town's sense of safety is rocked by a chilling 911 call. At 3 o'clock in the morning, there was a call from a woman that her husband had been shot and killed. There was a lot of shots. I ran back to the bedroom. The killer wasn't in the house. He was coming after us. I literally thought everybody was going to die, and I was so scared. Police raced to the home, expecting to encounter an active shooter. Their first thought is clearing that house, making sure that the killer's not still in the house. As the officer entered, the first thing that he noticed was the victim's body in the kitchen area. When they started calling out that they were the police and they were there, the wife was in a bedroom. She had retreated to seek safety for her and her children, which were still in the house. This is all just happening so quickly. I don't know how I'm supposed to trust that whoever's out there is not the killer. Officers find no sign of the gunman and assure Angelica it's safe to come out of the bedroom. The wife came out and she was very, very hysterical. When they walked me back out, when he was laying there on the floor, I knew he was gone. You have somebody murdering your husband and shooting you all in seconds. Nothing can prepare you for that. Angelica identifies the man as her husband, 30-year-old Ron Stovall. The children were taken to Ron's parents' house. They didn't live too far away. And the victim's wife went to the police department where we could talk to her. With Angelica and the children out of harm's way, detectives can examine the crime scene. As a responding detective, I would go in and start looking around Ron, the victim, he had been shot three times in the back, once in the hip, and there was a shot to the back of the head. Investigators find an important clue close to the victim's body. And there were some bloody footprints there on the floor. Part of those footprints had what looked like the letter H, two H's kind of next to each other on the sole. Whoever was wearing that shoe had perpetrated at least part of the crime because they would have been standing in the victim's blood and then exiting the residence following the homicide. The Stovall's front door also reveals how the murder unfolded. We could see her husband was shot outside and then the killer shot through the door and he got into the house and he had shot Ron in the back of the head. As daylight breaks, a forensic team scours the outside of the home. They found a handgun projectile out on the sidewalk near the driveway. 
the killer shot what it clearly looks like a handgun round to the lower extremities and then you have a shotgun round to the head. This was overkill. They stood over the body and delivered a fatal blow. When you see that type of crime scene, you're looking immediately for someone that displayed some type of grudge or emotional hatred for the victim. While forensics wrap up their investigation at the crime scene, detectives head to the police station to speak with Ron's wife, Angelica. We really took note how emotionally overtaken she was, but she had been an eyewitness to this scene. So she was critical in our investigation. I can't even comprehend what's going on. He was dead. I did not want to live without him. Ron was truly amazing. He was always full of life, very kind, sincere, very real. Born in Panama City, Ron Stovall was one of four siblings. He was very close with his family. He was always out doing stuff, doing stuff with school, doing stuff with the church. He was well known within the community. Ron served almost four years in the Navy. He had felt a commitment to his country and enjoyed his naval service. Ron always dreamt of having a family, and in 1989, he met his first wife, Tina Trexler. Tina and Ron got married. They had one child, they had a daughter. The marriage was a rocky one, and after six years, it fell apart. Soon after, Ron met single mom Angelica at a local beach bar. He said he knew from the second he saw me that he loved me. Our first night, we went on a date, took me to the beach, to the ocean, put out a blanket, listened to some Marvin Gaye, had Italian food. It was very romantic. He stole my heart, and I was never in love before. I just fell right into his arms. In 1997, the couple married. Just like Ron, Angelica had a child from a previous relationship. A year later, their family of four became five when they had a daughter of their own. Ron took on several jobs. He worked as a waiter. He worked as a delivery man for the UPS companies. He was very dedicated, and he just got his massage therapy license. He did everything for his family. We were very happy. Who would want to gun down this loving husband and father in cold blood? At the station, Angelica tells police how the murder unfolded. I was able to tell the cops everything I knew, and I didn't try to hold anything back. Ron got up at about 3 o'clock every morning, and I would get up and make his lunch for him to take to work. She explains how Ron left the house and was suddenly ambushed. There were some shots. I didn't know what was going on. He collapsed on the ground, and the killer tried coming through the door, so I was fighting with him. He got his hand through it, grabbed the gun, and he opened the door with his, with his hand, and I looked down that barrel of that silver gun, and he shot it. The bullet just misses Angelica. I ran back to the bedroom. As Angelica shares more details about the deadly attack, Detectives gain important information about the killer. She described him as male, brown eyes, brown hair, and that he had some type of facial hair, possibly a mustache. She indicated hearing the assailant say to Ron as he was delivering the fatal gunshot wound, this is for her. It sounded very evil. Angelica tells police she doesn't know the meaning behind the killer's words. We need to find out who her was, and we needed to find out what made this so personal to her. Well, this wasn't just a random killing. This was an assassination, is what it was. Investigators ask Angelica who might want Ron dead. Immediately, she went to Tina, his ex-wife. Ms. Stovall indicated that the relationship between Ron and his ex-wife was volatile. There was a custody issue over their daughter. Things got a little bit more sticky with the custody setup, and Ron was filing for full custody of the child. 
Could the bitter custody battle have turned deadly? This was an enormous red flag for us as a team. Whoever her was may have, in fact, had to do with his ex-wife. It's probably one of the worst situations we ever deal with, is with the man and woman and children involved. It will just about make a person do anything. Coming up, police uncover a key piece of evidence. He brings out a shotgun round that is similar to the one that we've recovered from our crime scene. Leading to a disturbing plot. The photo identification that made him a prime suspect. It was his eyes. What I saw was the same person. And a sickening betrayal no one saw coming. They planned this whole thing. None of us had ever worked a case like this. I do not understand how somebody can have so much hatred. Police investigating the cold-blooded shooting of 30-year-old Ron Stovall are looking into his relationship with his ex-wife, Tina Trexler. We knew that there was an extreme amount of tension between Ron and his ex-wife, and there was a custody battle that was forthcoming. Ron and Tina originally shared custody, but Ron had filed a petition basically saying that he wanted full custody of the child. Up to this point, Tina was that individual that had the most to gain from Ron's death. Perhaps she had not been the one on scene, but it still doesn't eliminate her as having some type of involvement. This looked like certainly a, an intentional and a premeditated killing. Might have been a killing for hire. Detectives speak to Ron's friends and family to get a clearer picture of the animosity with Tina. When Ron remarried, it was OK, but not really OK. Tina, as well as her family, did not like the new wife. And the situation deteriorated between all of them. As Ron and Angelica's family grew, Tina's behavior appeared increasingly erratic. Tina began feeling that Ron was trying to work Tina out of the picture as the mother. And so that had really kind of amplified the rub and the tension. There was all this, you know, crazy fighting, and it was too hard for his daughter. We were just concerned. This custody hearing was coming up in about two or three weeks from when this incident happened. Tina was absolutely the possible person who was involved in this murder. She had all the motive. Could the custody battle have driven Ron's ex-wife to murder? Investigators bring Tina in for an interview. One of the things that was most alarming when we sat down with Tina was that there was no remorse, no emotional activity on her part, that she was even concerned that he was dead. When investigators ask about her relationship with Ron, Tina's answer is surprising. We knew there were a lot of hostilities, but when Tina was interviewed, she kind of painted that the relationship with them was cordial, it was friendly. It's a red flag for us as investigators because she's already showing signs of deceit. With suspicions raised, detectives grilled Tina about her whereabouts in the hours leading up to Ron's murder. She told us the night before the homicide, she had went to work at a local restaurant. She was a bartender. She got off sometime between 11 and midnight. She had went home and sat and watched TV with her mother. Then after that, she had went to bed, and at the time of the homicide itself, she had been home asleep. Before police can press Tina further, the interview is interrupted. Her mother had hired a lawyer for her. The attorney made contact with Tina and immediately ended the interview. Unable to finish questioning Tina, detectives look into her alibi. Police were able to establish that she had been at work that night till 11.30, 12 o'clock. Investigators also speak with Tina's mother, Ann Trexler. She was the grandmotherly type and was helping Tina get back on her feet and help her get through this divorce. And come across as a very down-to-earth, nice lady, a housewife. And she confirmed that Tina had been at the house with her watching TV. Though Tina's alibi checks out, police still theorize that she could have hired someone to kill her ex-husband. We conducted a preliminary investigation into her financial records. Everything was consistent with that of just a working class individual making normal purchases. 
One week into the investigation with no concrete evidence pointing at Tina, police look for other suspects. They quickly discover Tina wasn't the only one in a dispute with Ron. Tina had a boyfriend. His name was Adrian Harris, and there had been some confrontations between Ron and Mr. Harris regarding the way Ron was treating Tina. And in fact, at one point, there had been some threats made on Harrison's part. Had Adrian decided to confront Ron, leading to deadly consequences? As we began looking into Mr. Harris, whether he was paid to do it or whether he did it on his own, we weren't sure. But the concern was that he may have perpetrated this to make good with Tina for the purpose of helping her. Investigators tracked down Adrian over 900 miles away near Baltimore. When we talked with Adrian, he did acknowledge that there was some bad blood between the two of them, but he really kind of downplayed the significance. The day of the murder, he told us he went to work. He had clocked in before 7.30, and the time of Ron's death was 3.30 in the morning. Detectives checked travel times between Baltimore and Panama City. There was not enough time to get to Panama City from several states away to do the murder and go back home. While Adrian is ruled out, someone close by catches the investigator's attention. We talked to his roommate, Guy McInvale. When the officers went to talk to Adrian's uh, roommate, they discovered the description of the killer that Angelica gave to the law enforcement. The roommate fit it quite well. Guy McInvale it had brown eyes, brown hair, and he had a mustache. Now we had another individual that we want to look at. Once we saw him, Guy fit the description. He was a roommate with Adrian Harris, and we knew that Harris and the victim had some bad blood between them. We thought maybe he went there to kill him. Is this the break police have been hoping for? Investigators rushed to confirm if Guy is a true match for the gunman. We got pictures of him to show the victim's wife, Angelica, see if he could have been the one that she saw that night. Back in Panama City, detectives include the picture of Guy into a photo lineup. Angelica was an essential witness. She was a witness who could identify the individual that did the crime. Her photographic identification, it was surprising. It has been two weeks since 30-year-old father, Ron Stovall, was shot to death at home in front of his wife, Angelica. Now, detectives hope she can identify the shooter from a photo lineup. She picked out Guy McInvale as being the killer. It was his eyes. There was something very, very similar. What I saw was the same person. There was an identification of Guy McInvale that made him a prime suspect. We have Ms. Stovall's positive identification of Guy as the individual that was in front of their house. There's a sense of relief that begins to sweep through the unit because you're finally on to a really developing hot lead. We want to now try to establish what type of physical evidence do we actually have between the victim, Ron, and Guy. Detectives get a search warrant and race over to Guy's Baltimore residence. They make a telling discovery. We search his items, and looking at me right square in the face was a pair of shoes consistent with the shoe impression that we had at the scene. So we're moving in the right direction. Police bring Guy to the local police station for questioning. And although we still were missing the key pieces of evidence, the guns and, and such as that, we really felt like we're starting to put together the edges of the puzzle. In speaking with Guy, what he provided us for an alibi was that he was in Maryland working at the end of work. He went home, slept. The next day, he got up, went to work. And so, so that was his alibi. Detectives check out Guy's story. We had had an opportunity to speak with Guy at his place of employment, and we were able to collect some video that, that correlated with his timeline of what he said. There was physically no way possible for him to have been here in Panama City at the time of the, the crime. It turned out that what Guy McInville said to the police was correct. 
Guy had an alibi. Eager to further prove his innocence, Guy volunteers to take a polygraph. He successfully passed that. So we were able to clear Mr. McInville. For police, it's a disappointing setback. We were pretty frustrated, and it's a roller coaster. It's one of those, now you're back in the lows again, and the wind was kind of taken out of our sails. Angelica wanted to help the officers along, but her perception at the time of the event was clouded by the terror, the trauma of the incident itself. I remember him being the same person. It stuck in my head like that, but I was wrong. It's difficult when you see something that quick that you can say, OK, this is the individual that did the crime. We thought we had this thing solved, but you just got to go regroup, see what you still have to do, and you just start from there. Desperate for new leads, investigators review Ron's autopsy report. The autopsy confirmed two different weapons. They told us that it was a 357 round that he had been shot with, plus the shotgun shell. One big thing we learned was that shotgun residue got in his face. We think that Ron was laying there on the floor, and this guy's saying this is for her, and he presses that shotgun to the back of his head, and Ron's looking at him when that went off. The forensics report contains another crucial detail that could lead police to the killer. These were close proximity rounds, and so we knew that this was something personal. And the shotgun shell was paramount. It was a unique round. We would be able to identify it. So that was a plus in our corner. Detectives shared details of the firearms with local law enforcement, hoping to track down their owner. We work so closely with the different police departments in the area. We talk to them all the time in case something turns up. As investigators continue to search for answers, Ron's loved ones struggle with their grief. The best thing in my life was that life. I didn't think I was strong enough to go through anything. Without him, he was always full of life. Losing your soulmate, you can't even explain how much pain that was. It still is. It'll never go away. Three weeks after Ron's murder, the investigation is threatening to grow cold, but then police receive a tip that reignites the case. We got a call from the Panama City Beach Police Department. They had a home invasion out there on the beach. During that arrest, they recovered two handguns and a short barrel shotgun. They knew from the investigation of the crime scene where Ron Stovall was killed that a shotgun had been used and that a handgun had been used. That coincides with what we're looking for. We wanted to go over the evidence they had and the circumstances. Could these be the weapons connected to Ron's murder? The gentleman that they arrested, we started looking into him and looking at his background and everything. And he had a pretty lengthy criminal history, had actually been uh, linked to some murders in the past. He really caught our attention. This turned out to be a big break. Police in Panama City are investigating the cold-blooded homicide of husband and father, Ron Stovall. They now believe the missing murder weapons were used in a home invasion robbery less than 15 miles away. When meeting with this investigator from the Beach Police Department, what he produced from his crime scene was this, a handgun and a sawed-off shotgun. That coincides with what we're looking for. Then he brings out a shotgun round that is similar to the one that we've recovered from our crime scene. We have everything that meets the parameters. Now we, we really believe we, we're on the right path. The weapons are sent off to the crime lab. While detectives await the results, they dig deeper into this new lead. At the Beach Police Department, they identified the individual as a Tony Alberto Perez. He went by Tony. He had an extensive criminal history. There was some acts of violence in his past or some drugs in his past. They really felt like he was a, a pretty violent individual. 
another detail catches their attention. Tony had brown eyes, brown hair, and facial hair. He looks just like our guy. He met Ms. Stovall's physical description to a T. Investigators head to the nearby jail where Tony is being held for the home invasion. He come across as a kind of a likable guy. He was laughing and cutting up, but the more he talked, more red flags went up. He began bragging about other involvements that he had had with acts of violence. He was completely nonchalant about it. Detectives turn up the heat and ask Tony if he killed Ron Stovall. Tony totally denied any involvement, any knowledge of Ron, any knowledge of anything that may have happened on that date, and basically told law enforcement, it's not me, I'm not the person. Despite Tony's denials, investigators believe he's withholding information, and they obtain a search warrant. Tony Perez had items that he owned stored at the landlord's house, and we're searching through Tony Perez's items over there. And then we find a pair of work boot type shoes. While inspecting the footwear, detectives notice a key detail. Those work boots had what looked like the letter H, two H's kind of next to each other on the sole. It looked like what we had found at the crime scene. And we got those sent right off to the lab. As police hunt for more incriminating evidence against Tony, the ballistic results come back. And we actually got confirmation from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement that the, the guns collected that Tony had been in possession of matched perfectly ballistically to the rounds that we had recovered from our scene. That evidence right there is one of the biggest things you could have in any murder case. You can find the weapons and find a person who has the weapons, that's major. So now that we can put Tony, at least the guns, at the scene, that gave us the ability to change gears with Tony. We had the information and ammunition that we needed to confront Tony about what really happened. Detectives head back to the jail to interview their prime suspect. As Tony began to kind of spin his version of what happened to Ron, now he acknowledged having a little knowledge of it, but he said that he had loaned his guns to someone else and that he didn't know what they did with him. He didn't have any involvement in it. But what he says is that he had heard Ron was dealing drugs, and that's why he was killed. We had already done a thorough background on Ron. We knew Ron was not involved in any drug business. We had talked to too many people. He was a happily married man trying to make it in life. That's what Ron was. Then Tony gave us information that would kind of put us on some individuals that might be involved, and we tracked those individuals down, and we were able to confirm 100% that they had nothing to do with Ron's death. People sometimes, when they are being questioned, especially when the police have some of the goods on them, will make up stories, and that's what Perez did. As far as the police could determine, that was a total concoction by Tony Perez. Detectives believe Tony is lying, but wonder what motive he could have to kill Ron. We were still kind of struggling to establish how Tony would have came into Ron's life. Going through Tony's belongings, we found some cell phone bills there, and they were linked to the name of Kim Miller. Kim Miller turned out to be Tony's girlfriend. So we went to talk to Kim. Kim Miller is the owner of a Panama City hair salon. Tony and Kimberly, they had been in a romantic relationship for several months. We were told by Kim that Tony, he was doing odd things for her. He would come around the hair salon and he would actually shampoo customers' hair, clean up, sweep up the shop, things like that. Investigators look for a connection between Tony and Ron Stovall. Kim was familiar with the, the Stovall homicide. She claims that she first heard about it because she had a customer that had called in and canceled her hair appointment saying how her ex-son-in-law had been murdered. When detectives ask Kim for the customer's name, they receive a startling response. The connection kind of came out of nowhere and almost as a surprise. Kim's clients is Ann Trexler, who happens to be Tina's mother, Tina Ron's ex-wife.
Police believe husband and father, Ron Stovall, was shot and killed by criminal Tony Perez. They're now exploring a potential link between Tony and Ron's ex-wife, Tina Trexler. When Kim Miller indicated that she styled Tina's mother, Van Trexler's hair, and law enforcement was pretty stunned by that. Ann Trexler is the mother of Ron's ex-wife, Tina. We knew of the ongoing hostilities between Ron and Tina. So when we talked with Kim Miller, we asked her if she had ever met Tina, his ex-wife, and she did met her on a couple of occasions. Tina's mother, Ann, however, was a regular client, was in there on a regular basis. With Tina previously eliminated from the investigation, detectives asked Kim more about Tina's mother, 52-year-old Ann Trexler. She told us that Ann's talking to her and telling her about these problems with her daughter going through this custody battle with her ex-husband. And she was upset about it. She's afraid she's going to lose her grandchild. Ann had told Kimberly the Trexlers had to get a second mortgage on their home to provide a legal assistance to Tina. Could the custody battle be the motive behind Ron's murder? At that point, we were trying to determine exactly who she was. She hadn't really been on our radar at all. We knew that she was Tina's mom. We knew that she was Tina's alibi at the time of this crime. And Trexler, no criminal history, supposedly a wonderful grandmother and fine Christian lady who would never be involved in something like this. Investigators contact Ron's wife, Angelica, and learn his custody dispute with Tina brought out a different side to his former mother-in-law. Apparently, they had a good relationship when Tina and, and them were married, but it was just a, a constant, constant battle over visitation rights. Always just such a fight with her. Looking to see if Anne could have anything to do with Ron's murder, detectives bring her in for an interview. When we talked to her, she stated to us that there was no way that she had anything to do with killing him. She did not want him dead. Matter of fact, she said she loved him. And then Ann Trexler wanted a lawyer. And once, once they get a lawyer, you, you're done talking. So we're kind of getting a heightened sense of concern as far as her involvement in the case, because she decided to basically not cooperate with the investigation. Having hit a wall with Ann, Detectives get a breakthrough when forensics results arrive. We got confirmation that Tony's boot was consistent with the shoe impression that we had at the scene. Also, Tony had been in possession of the guns used. Now you've got a personal item putting him at the crime scene. At that point, we knew we had our shooter. I mean, that's a big piece of evidence right there. We were able to go back to Tony and present him with what we knew. He admitted killing Ron, his very words were, OK, I did it. It's the shortest confession to a murder I've ever taken in my career. Investigators push Tony to reveal how the crime unfolded, and what he tells them is shocking. Tony told us that Ann Trexler wanted to have her ex-son-in-law killed and was willing to pay to have it done. When we found out Ann Trexler wanted to hire somebody to kill Ron, I mean, this this just, this is unbelievable. Ex-mother-in-law going to get involved and have, have pay somebody to kill her ex-son-in-law? He had met Ann at the hair salon. She was complaining about Ron and that the two of them had worked out a deal for Tony to kill Ron in exchange for about $10,000 to be paid to Tony. On November 10, 1998, Tony is charged with the first degree murder of Ron Stovall. But the case is far from over. Detectives turn their attention back to alleged mastermind Ann Drexler. Searching for answers, detectives pull Ann's phone records. The phone records were a treasure trove of information. They showed a lot of phone traffic between Kim Miller and Antonio Perez and Ann Trexler. It clearly looks like Kimberly was the middle person between Ann and Tony. There were phone calls between the Trexler house and Kim Miller at strange hours of the night for strange amounts of time that could not be explained away by saying, 
we're setting up our rents and set. Another thing, we were able to show that Ann Trexler received a phone call from Kim Miller the morning right after Ron's death. So there were links to tie Ann Trexler to this plot, but there was no hard concrete connection of evidentiary value. We needed something else that would show that Ann, in fact, had hired Antonio Perez to kill Ron Stovall. Tony Perez, he says that he had come to an agreement with Ann Trexler, killed Ron for $10,000. Detectives scour Ann's financial records for any signs she had commissioned Ron's murder. We have withdrawals from her banking accounts that coincide with when Tony says he was paid and the amount that he was paid. So now we have proof that what Tony's telling us is accurate regarding being paid. With regards to Ann, none of us had ever worked a case like this. So it was kind of a shock that all of these pieces were kind of lining up to support she is the motivation to this entire crime. But we felt like we still could not make the case against Ann Trexler. We needed someone to corroborate what Tony Perez said. We needed somebody else that can draw the line between the money and the murder of Ron Stovall. We have to go back to the middleman in, in the case, which is Kim Miller. She's the whole key to this thing. She was looking at criminal charges, but without her, we're not going to get Ann. She is the only way that we're going to have true accounts of what happened. We went and picked up Kim Miller and brought her in. Kim Miller, she stonewalled. She said no. I'm not talking to you. I'm not telling you anything. Investigators working the Ron Stovall homicide have charged shooter Tony Perez with murder and believe the mastermind is Ron's former mother-in-law, Ann Trexler. But to build an ironclad case, they need Tony's girlfriend and go-between, Kim Miller, to share what she knows. However, Kim is refusing to talk. It really wasn't until we actually laid out in front of her the phone records and drew the lines between Ann and her and her and Tony that we were able to convince her to cooperate with the investigation. We let her know, you know, she was going to be charged with accessory to the murder, and she's facing life in prison. Prosecutors offer Kim a deal a reduced sentence in exchange for testifying against Ann Trexler. Eventually, Kim takes the deal. Kim sang like a songbird. Kimberly was very adamant that there was a deep-seated hatred for Ron on Ann Trexler's part. She indicated that on many occasions, Ann Trexler ranted and raved about Ron Stovall, how bad he was, that he was going to remove her granddaughter. She wished that somebody would take him out, and it got more and more. Finally, Kim said, OK, if you're really serious, I know somebody who might help you. Kim lets her know that her boyfriend, Tony Perez, will get rid of him for $10,000. That's how the deal came about. Kim then reveals how in the early hours of October 6th, Tony drove to the Stovall house to lie in wait for Ron. About 3 o'clock in the morning, when Ron went out to his vehicle, Tony took a shot at him with a pistol. And Ron ran inside and slammed the door behind him. And Tony Perez fired more shots, which struck Ron in the back. To finish Ron off, Tony tried to force his way inside the house. Angelica, she tried to hold the door, and Tony Perez fired a shot that almost struck her. She ran to the other room to call 911. Tony Perez came in, and he found Ron on the floor and walked up with a shotgun, said, this is for her. Boom. He killed Ron Stovall right there. When he made the statement, this is for her, it's our belief that Tony was doing this on Ann's behalf. Tony came there to do one thing, and that was to kill Ron Stovall. Once he had made his getaway, he was able to reach out to Kimberly and make notice to her that, in fact, the job had been done. And then, of course, she notified Ann. Kim swears Ron's ex-wife, Tina Trexler, wasn't involved in their murderous plan. Law enforcement looked at Tina Trexler 
Her mother, Ann, may have confided in her, but no one could get to that much evidence to put Tina in the situation of taking Ron's life. Ann Trexler, she tried to be the, you know, the grandmotherly type, but she planned this whole thing. Ann Trexler's thought pattern was Ron Stovall is getting ready to take my only precious granddaughter away from me, and I won't have visitation, and he left my daughter, he married somebody else, he, he should not be able to get away with it. From an investigator's perspective, Ann carried just as much weight as Tony. Without Ann, Tony would not have even known who Ron Stovall was. On February 15th, 2000, Ann Trexler is formally charged with the murder of her former son-in-law, Ron Stovall. When the cops called and he said, got her, she's in jail. She is morbidly evil. The darkest, blackest soul ever. And then she'll put on a face like she's just Miss Innocent. The killer, he didn't know Ron and knew Ron. I do not understand how somebody can have so much hatred in their body, in their mind, in their heart. In court, shooter Tony Perez pleads guilty and is sentenced to life without parole. In February 2000, Kim Miller is sentenced to five years probation as part of her deal with prosecutors. Finally, in 2001, Anne's trial begins and she pleads not guilty. Ann Trexler took the stand. She testified about not being involved. She testified about her concerns uh, of her grandchild and the fact that she had absolutely no involvement. On May 14, 2001, the jury finds Ann Trexler guilty of first-degree murder. She's sentenced to life in prison without parole. There's a little peace. I'm in a little peace in this horrible thing. A little justice, I guess. It gets a little emotional sometimes. It's not just me. You know, we, we're a whole team working this thing. It, we celebrated, I'll just say that. We celebrated this one. The most striking thing to me is that these are all ordinary people. And it's a little bit frightening to think that people who are walking around living everyday ordinary lives would be capable of this. The one that initiated it all was someone that if you passed on the street would look as innocent as they come. For Ron's family, his loss continues to be deeply felt. I miss him and I love him so much. <laughs> My poor daughter, she never got the honor that she deserved. She never got her daddy. We celebrate his life all the time. He loved life. He loved to, to be happy. And I tried so hard to keep his memory alive, very much so. I will never forget how amazing Ron was. A loving and outgoing mother of three. Everybody wanted to be around her and her energy and her beauty. She was an incredible human being and a great mother. Is found murdered in a farmer's field. There was numerous blunt force trauma injuries. Cuts, lacerations, bruising throughout her body. This poor woman was brutally, brutally attacked and murdered. As detectives hunt the killer, they unearth dark secrets. All the information kept leading us to think that he was trying to find a way out of this relationship. He would draw off, break stuff. It was really controlling, it was really manipulative. They had an argument, something happened, it went too far. Then, new revelations turn the case on its head. In the video, there is a male party following her into the darkness. I did absolutely nothing to do with What did you have nothing to do with? And points to a predator no one saw coming. It was definitely a very big twist. When the news came out, he made me sick when I saw him. He looked like a monster.
Green Bay, Wisconsin is a relatively small, close-knit community where a lot of people know each other. Obviously, our claim to fame is having the Green Bay Packers in town here. So during football season, pretty much everything centers around that. It's 100% a place that you would want to raise a family. The crime rate in the Green Bay area is generally very low, especially when it comes to violent crime. On a warm May afternoon in 2016, nearby Brown County Sheriff's Office gets a troubling 911 call from a local farmer. Brown County 911, what's your emergency? Oh God, we just found a human body. Is it a male or a female? It's got long hair, uh, but I didn't go near it. I'm about okay. at the top of a hill just looking down on it. The 911 call was from farmers working in a field and they located a body. Investigators race to the farmer's field on the outskirts of Green Bay. The body was behind a brushy, woody area, not visible by the road itself. It was laying face down with arms spread across the front of her head and feet towards the road. The victim was a blonde female, uh, approximately in her 30s. Past that, we really didn't have any identifying information other than the pink wristband on her wrist. There was a distinct pattern that we found on the victim's back, which appeared to be from the sole of the shoe. It wasn't until the body was turned that all the injuries were located. The extent of injuries that she suffered were pretty horrific. There was trauma to her neck that would indicate possible strangulation, in addition to lacerations, bruising throughout her body. Her fingernails were damaged, indicative of defensive wounds. That tells us that she was fighting for her life. There were nail clippings taken for the potential of any DNA from the suspect underneath her fingernails. We were looking for anything that could be used as a weapon. However, the search of the area didn't reveal anything. After questioning the farmer and clearing him of any suspicion, investigators try to determine how the victim ended up in his field. The area was searched thoroughly for any clothing that may have been left behind, any other tracks, footprints. There were a set of tire tracks that went from the driveway to where the victim's body was found and then circled back towards the driveway. The farmers work in the field were using a skidster and a four-wheeler, and they definitely didn't match those pieces of equipment. We definitely felt like this was likely the suspect vehicle that was used to transport the body there. As detectives continue to process the crime scene, the local sheriff's office receives another call. Brown County Public Safety, this is Therese. How do I go about, uh, I guess, a uh, missing person? Okay, and who who's missing? It's my girlfriend. What's her name? Nicole Vanderheiden. Our dispatch center received a phone call from a party named Doug Dietrich reporting that he did not know where his girlfriend was. And the last he had seen or heard from her was the night before. We felt very strongly that the missing person report was gonna involve the victim we had in the field. Officers from the crime scene are dispatched to interview the caller, 34-year-old Doug Dietrich, who lived with his girlfriend, Nicole Vanderheiden. Is Doug here? Hi, I'm here for a missing persons report. Yes. As allowed by Wisconsin law, Officers secretly filmed the conversation. It was important to record the interview with Doug. Based on the victim in the field, it's always in the back of my mind that this could be some kind of domestic violence issue that happened. Doug looked completely hungover. He had really dark circles under his eyes. He looked like he hadn't slept in days. I asked him why he's making this missing persons report. He's only seen or heard from her since last night, but I'd say like, what, midnight? Midnight, yeah. Uh... OK. Doug indicated that uh, he and Nikki joined a group of friends out at a local establishment to participate in watching a, a live band. Doug provides a telling detail when asked what Nikki was wearing. She would have had a bracelet on. Okay. Like the, it, was a, it was a pink bracelet for okay. the 21 verification. 
there was a wristband that the victim was wearing. So based on that information, we were quite certain that it was Nikki that we were with in the field. As police work to confirm that the victim in the field is 31-year-old mother of three, Nicole Vanderheiden, they learn more about her background. Nikki was born in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, and then she went to high school here. She was the most amazing, inspiring, beautiful, happy woman I have ever met in my life. She always enjoyed being around family. After high school, Nikki attended the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, graduating in 2010. Nikki's background included a double major in science and education. From that, she was a substitute school teacher. Nikki was one of the hardest workers I've known. She always had two jobs as a substitute teacher and waitressing. Outside of work, Nikki was dedicated to fitness. She definitely took care of herself and she worked out a lot. Everybody wanted to be around her and her energy and her beauty. We always complimented how beautiful she was and she was inside and out. In 2005, Nikki got married and had two children, but the marriage ended in 2012. Nikki was definitely a hands-on mom. I think it made her proud to be able to do that because being a single mother is not easy. Then in 2015, Nikki met Doug Dietrich. Nikki and Doug had a spark. They moved very quickly and got pregnant and she was so excited to become a mother of three beautiful children. Nikki and Doug were still learning to live with one another. It was definitely a life changer. As Nikki's boyfriend, Doug is a leading suspect in her murder. He is brought to the sheriff's office for a formal interview and informed that the body police have found is most likely Nikki. This body that was found down the street, there's a lot of similarities. Doug was crying, emotional, in a state of shock. With Nikki identified as the victim, detectives asked Doug to recount the events leading up to the last time he saw her alive. Doug reported that they had been out at a concert at the Watering Hole, which is a bar in a suburb of Green Bay. As the night progressed, they had been consuming alcohol, and Doug had ran into some friends from high school that he had not seen in a while. And he confirmed that Nikki was mad because she saw Doug talking to another female at the watering hole, and this basically set her off. From there, they got separated. He stayed at the watering hole with his friend Greg, and Nikki went with their friend group to the sardine can, which is downtown Green Bay. Doug had last actually seen Nikki around 11.30 when she departed from the watering hole to the sardine can. At some point, Nikki did get a hold of Doug on the phone. What did she say? Who are you talking to? She was hysterical, drunk, and irrational. Not making any sense. Detectives ask if they can search Doug's phone for any texts he'd exchanged with Nikki. Nikki was definitely angry texting Doug. She made mention of what bitch are you talking to? She was accusing him of cheating, telling him that he was abusive. It was actually a really big red flag for me. Had Doug and Nikki's argument escalated into violence later that night? It started to kind of click with everybody that they had an argument, something happened, it went too far, and Doug may be involved. Coming up, detectives learn more about the night of the murder. When we look at the video footage, you can see a male follower out of the gate. We are trying to figure out what exactly happened a short distance away out of camera view. She's not wanting to have anything to do with him and starts turning into an argument and becomes a little bit physical. And uncover surprising new suspects. I'm gonna tell you that your timeline seems so abundantly rehearsed. The time, to be honest with us, is right now before a stunning twist throws the case into turmoil. The true killer came completely out of left field. 
The Google dashboard data showed him at every single crime scene that we had. I was very concerned who this could be. Who did this to our beloved Nikki? After confirming that the body discovered in a farm field is 31-year-old mother of three, Nikki Vanderheiden, Police suspect that her violent murder may be linked to an angry exchange of texts she had with her boyfriend, Doug Dietrich, the night she was killed. The text messages definitely led us to believe that if Nikki would have made it home and if she would have had contact with Doug, there would have been some sort of altercation. When detectives pressed Doug about what happened that night, he claims that after 12.30 a.m., he and his friend Greg left the bar they'd been at to look for Nikki at another bar. Doug describes getting the sardine can with Greg, finding that Nikki's not there, and then continuing to look around for her and being concerned. Doug stated that he had assumed that Nikki made it home and that she would be there when he got there. So him and Greg got in their car and drove home. With Nikki's two older children away for the night with their father, Doug says he got home to find the babysitter and his son, but no Nikki. She said to me, I haven't heard from Nikki, and I was just kind of figuring wherever she went, you know, with friends or whatever. And that's why I just, okay, I went to bed. She did not come home at all last night after you. Not at all. Not, a, it wasn't a, a look or word from her. He said that he woke up to give the baby a bottle at 6.30 in the morning, and Nikki wasn't there. And it did not appear that Mr. Dietrich was all that concerned until later in the day, which drew our suspicions. I did have concern as to why did it take until about 4.30 the next day to report her missing. Following their interview with Doug, investigators obtain a sample of his DNA and release him. The initial interview with Doug was basically to get him locked in so that we could corroborate everything that he was telling us through either physical evidence or through other statements from other witnesses. As police set out to verify Doug's story, Nikki's family and friends learned that she's been murdered. Knowing that Nikki was murdered and how horrific it was impacted our lives in a very horrible way. Who the hell would do this to someone with such an amazing, beautiful soul? Reports of Nikki's murder spread shock through the community, and Nikki's family members share their grief on local news. Heather Meyer and her family say it doesn't oh, seem real. Terrible. Absolutely terrible. She's been no. extremely up and down, numbing pain. As Nikki's loved ones continue reeling from her death, an officer from the sheriff's office makes a crucial find. An officer located some clothing on the side of the road, approximately a mile drive from where Nikki's body was located. Deputies were able to identify the clothing as Nikki's. There was blood located at numerous areas in the clothing. The majority of the blood was in her pants area. There was also a purse located which contained her ID. Her cell phone was also found at that same location. It was pretty apparent that it just got tossed out the window in a panic just by the suspect wanting to get rid of it. As they submit Nikki's items to the lab for testing, detectives receive her autopsy report. The primary injuries were the strangulation and trauma to the head. They had discovered over 240 injuries to Nikki's body, including 30 to her head and face area. The last few minutes of Nikki's life would have been very painful. There were injuries to her genitalia, which could be indicative of a sexual assault. The medical examiners did do a sexual assault exam, which included swabbing for evidence. The lab started finding a partial male profile, but they didn't have enough information to get an identification of it. The crime lab advised us that we would need to continue to submit samples that the suspect would have touched. We're only allowed to send in so many exhibits at a time as the crime lab is very busy. 
We have hundreds of swabbings of Nikki's clothing. So I started off with areas where you would more likely see some touch DNA. While they await answers from the crime lab, detectives get a hold of security video to learn what they can about Nikki's last hours. When we first were able to take a look at the video footage from the sardine can, we were able to identify Nikki there with Doug's friends. Initially, she appeared to be having a good time dancing around. The later portion of the evening, we can see Nikki and her group of friends at an outside table, and you can see Nikki looking down at her phone. You can tell by her body movements that she is upset. And eventually, um, she gets up and storms off through an entrance that they're sitting nearby. What detectives see next catches their attention. After Nikki leaves, you can see a male follow her out of the gate. Police ask themselves, who was this man? And was he involved in Nikki's murder? We knew that his information was going to be vital. That was the last time Nikki was seen before she was killed. We wanted to know everything that he saw and heard because he's the last known person that we knew that saw her alive. The day after Nikki Vanderheiden is found murdered in a farmer's field, investigators are trying to track down the man seen following her out of a bar just hours before she was killed. In the video, there is a male party following after Nikki and walking off into the darkness. We are trying to figure out what exactly happened a short distance away out of camera view. Officers are dispatched to interview patrons who were at the bar that night. Based on the interviews with the witnesses, we knew that male was Aaron Kalinske. This was a friend that they were with earlier in the night. Police track Aaron down and bring him in for an interview. Aaron advised us that throughout most of the night, Nikki was having a great time. And then at some point, he saw a mood shift in her. He basically had said that Nikki was trying to get a hold of Doug and that he wasn't responding. Nikki ultimately became very angry, and that's when she left the sardine can on foot. Aaron describes following her and trying to convince her to come back and get a taxi or an Uber to go back home. What Aaron says happened next raises detective suspicion. But she's not wanting to have anything to do with him, and it becomes, starts turning into an argument and becomes a little bit physical. At one point, Nikki fell to the ground on her own, and she started creating a bigger scene. Aaron advised us that she began kicking and punching at him as he was trying to help her up. He had tried to tell her, hey, we can get you home, you can come with us, but she refused. Aaron noticed that there were people in the neighborhood seeing what was going on, so he decided to just leave it alone at that point. Investigators wonder if there's more to the story than Aaron's telling them. We are actually able to find those people, and they indeed remembered a female and male yelling or having a disagreement. Continuing to watch the video, Aaron does return a very short time later. And based on the other statements of, from the friends that were with the group, we knew that Aaron didn't necessarily do anything wrong. Aaron says he and his friends took an Uber home, never to see Nikki alive again. There was video footage that showed Aaron and the other group leaving in an Uber, and there was no indication that they had come back to the area after they left. With Aaron crossed off the list, police continue scouring the bar's security video for clues and find something unexpected. We eventually saw Doug and Greg arrive there. Doug told us they're looking all over for Nikki, but the video is showing that he and Greg go to the bar and just start hanging out. It definitely isn't consistent with the sense of concern that he was initially talking about. According to the surveillance video, Doug and Greg stayed at that sardine can until about 2.15 in the morning. And the fact that Doug said that they did all this looking while at the sardine can told us that he's not being entirely truthful with his efforts to locate her. Detectives wonder if Doug had misled them about his concern for Nikki. Was there something he was hiding? 
Just the mere fact that he didn't know where his girlfriend was and didn't appear to care all that much was a red flag. With their suspicion growing, police reach out to Nikki's family to learn more about her relationship with Doug. Nikki's mother and sister, they both voice concerns of Doug's behavior. I know, it's been really, really rocky during her pregnancy and their relationship. Nikki's mom, as well as her sister, Heather, both say that they wouldn't be surprised if Doug was the person that was responsible for this. Investigators search Doug's name in police records and make an alarming discovery. Checking police records, we did locate past girlfriends that uh, accused him of being abusive. Uh, there was at least one incident that was reported to police, but was never charged. Police contact the woman who filed a complaint against Doug and ask her for more details. When you would argue, it would be... He would spit uh, my face. Okay. He would, you know, throw stuff, break stuff. He was really controlling. He was really manipulative. So when we saw that, that was obviously very concerning to us. He tackled me and broke my ankle. Despite learning that Doug's ex-girlfriend had a prior assault conviction and that Doug had never been formally charged for domestic violence, investigators remained suspicious. At this point, we had the information that showed there could be the pattern of this abusive, aggressive behavior. And we know that Doug and Nicole had a volatile relationship which would lead us to believe that there would be some sort of confrontation that night. Police obtain a warrant to search Doug and Nicole's home. During the search at Doug and Nikki's house, there were several things of concern that were located. There was blood on the floor in the garage. There was blood and dirt found in Nikki's vehicle. There was also a, a set of Nike Air Jordan shoes that had a herringbone pattern on them which was similar to what was on Nikki's back. There was also some red marks on the surface appeared to be blood on the bottom of those shoes. While conducting the search, Doug's neighbors from across the street approached police with a startling new discovery. While mowing their lawn, they noticed a blood spot on the curb line of their property. And also they hit a cord of some type with their lawnmower. We did find a large quantity of what appeared to be dried blood, as well as two pieces of electrical phone charging cord. There was also some clumps of blonde hair. The blood on those items and the blood found in the road were positively identified as Nikki's. It was pretty apparent to us that that's where the altercation took place. That's where she was likely killed. When that crime scene in front of the house was located, that gave us a theory of what happened, and it continued to point us towards Doug as a suspect. After determining that Nikki Vanderheiden was likely murdered on the street in front of the home she shared with Doug Dietrich, investigators are weighing a growing body of evidence against Doug. This evidence that we found is kind of emboldening what we had initially thought, that Nikki got home, an argument ensued between her and Doug, and this incident took place in the street, and somehow some of that evidence would have gotten transformed into the garage and then into Nikki's vehicle. Looking at the totality of the circumstances, we decided there was probable cause to arrest Doug at that point. Okay. Um, right now, I'm going to be taking you into custody, be handcuffing you. I'll explain all that to you in a bit, um, and transporting you down to the sheriff's department. Okay? Okay. So be cooperative with me. All right. With Doug in custody, detectives work to solidify their case against him. When we did the search of Nikki's car and found the blood and the dirt in the car. It was initially thought that that may have been the vehicle that was used to take Nikki to the field where she was located. 
One of the things that we learned was that she had a progressive snapshot device in her vehicle, which is used for driving behavior, insurance rates. But we figured that this could help us show location from the night she was murdered. Once we got those records back, it was found that her vehicle did not move the night of her murder. At that point, all kinds of questions are still out there. The big one being, if Doug was involved in this, how Doug may have moved her? Did he use a different vehicle? Did he have help? We knew that Doug's vehicle was not in play. It was at the watering hole all night, where it was verified on video. One person whose name came up was Greg Matthew, who was actually driving Doug during their night out and dropped Doug off at home. Greg was Doug's best friend, was with Doug that entire night, and we were focused on him maybe being an accessory. Investigators bring Greg to the sheriff's office and ask him about the night of the murder. Greg was very exact about timelines of phone calls and what they did that night. 1215, he got in my car, and Nikki was calling him, you know, yelling at him, telling him she's leaving. By the time we get back to the sardine can, all of our friends left. At what point we left, you know, it was probably 2, 2.15. We got to Doug's house probably at 2.45 and went back to my house. My parents were home. They know that I was there the rest of that night. Greg's timeline was very consistent with Doug's, which was suspicious in nature that you usually aren't going to have your times down that path. I'm going to tell you that your timeline seems so abundantly rehearsed. So the, the time to be honest with us is right now. We pressed Greg very hard, hoping that we would find some sort of inconsistencies in his story or get him to crack and, and finally turn on Doug. Honestly, I had absolutely, absolutely nothing to do with, with what? What did you have nothing to do with? Anything to do with what? did you have nothing to do with? So I would like to leave. After becoming upset with some questions, he did leave while investigators were still sitting at the interview table talking to him. Investigators asked Greg's parents to confirm his alibi of coming straight home from Doug's shortly after 2.45 a.m. Greg's parents told us they were only going off of what he told them. They didn't physically see him or have any firsthand knowledge. While detectives keep Greg on the board as a potential accomplice to Doug, they receive DNA test results from the crime scene there was little to no sign of Doug's DNA anywhere on Nicole's body or clothing. Doug's DNA profile is not matching up with an unknown male DNA profile that we're finding on those items. Test results on other evidence bring even more disappointing news for investigators. It turns out the blood on the floor of the garage was likely from a turkey that Doug had killed while hunting. The blood in Nikki's car was from one of her other children, and it was not Nikki's. What we thought was blood on the bottom of the shoe tested inconclusive for blood. So all those things that we thought we believed to be Nikki's blood turned out not to be. We also got location data from Doug and Greg's cell phones that corroborated their account of where they were that night down to the times they left the bar, the route they took home, then when they got back to Doug's house, and from there. With no concrete evidence linking Doug to Nikki's murder, authorities release him from jail. Doug's DNA isn't really showing up where we thought it was gonna be, and there's still this unknown male profile that really threw a curve at us. Police believe that Nikki was murdered in front of her own home. But if Doug hadn't killed her, who had? I was very concerned who this could be, who this monster could have been that did this to our beloved Nikki. Two days after finding Nikki Vanderheiden savagely murdered, 
Detectives hunting her killer arrested her boyfriend, Doug Dietrich. But when DNA evidence exonerates Doug, detectives turn their focus to one urgent question. The biggest question we had to answer outside of who did this was how did she get home? We spent countless hours watching video surveillance of every single known business between Nikki's residence and the sardine can. We had investigators watching highway camera footage, bridge camera footage to see if we could catch either her walking or crossing the river to get to that side of town. We were running out of leads. It was frustrating at times. Still hoping for a DNA match to the killer, investigators continue sending the crime lab samples of Nikki's clothing found at the side of the road. We picked 10 items at a time for testing. We were looking for any items that we believe might contain more of this unknown male's DNA, hoping for a full profile. After sending several batches and not coming up with anything definitive, we end up sending a batch that included the socks that Nikki was wearing still when her body was found. The crime lab were able to get enough of a profile off of that sock to be able to enter it into the CODIS system. The suspect somehow got some touch DNA on those socks. Entered into the National DNA Database, the profile returns a hit that takes investigators by surprise. The DNA hit that we received was that of George Stephen Birch, who was from the state of Virginia. As far as we knew, he had no relation to anybody that was with Nikki that night or Nikki herself. All the information we had was leading us towards Doug. So once we got that DNA information, it was very surprising. George Birch was in and out of prison on the East Coast, and at some point earlier in 2016, had moved to the Green Bay area. So we start digging through the Green Bay Police Department records, see what we can find out about him. George Stephen Birch was contacted by the Green Bay Police Department a few weeks after the homicide for a hit and run car accident. The vehicle was a Chevy S10 Blazer that was found a short distance away from where Mr. Birch was staying. At the time, he was questioned about it and claimed that the vehicle must have been stolen. Suspicious about the nature and timing of the supposed theft, investigators see if his Chevy Blazer could have been used to dump Nikki's body. We ended up comparing the specs of a Chevy Blazer and the width of the tire tracks that we found in the field, and we found it to be a very near match. Digging deeper, detectives find even more evidence connecting George to Nikki's last known movements. We knew that he hung out at a bar that was down in that same general area of the sardine can. We were able to identify Birch's Google account and track the location of the cell phone that that Google account is associated with. The Google dashboard data showed us road map of Mr. Birch's whereabouts that night, and he was found at every single crime scene that we had, including the farm field, Nicole and Doug's residence, the roadway where Nicole's property was found, and then back at his residence. When we got that information, we knew we had our guy at that point. Police track down George Birch and bring him into the sheriff's office. When we had our contact with Mr. Birch, it was obvious that this wasn't his first contact with law enforcement. He's very cool, very calm. The reason you're here is into, uh, in reference to a homicide investigation into Nicole Vanderheide, okay? So is this something that you want to talk to me about? Yes, sir. But then we're for a lawyer. Okay. Birch didn't provide any details or provide his version of events of anything. We still didn't necessarily have the details on how they met, why they were together. But with DNA and other evidence firmly implicating him, police charged George Birch with Nikki's murder. When the suspect was arrested, it was a result of actual physical evidence. And I felt so much relief that the family would never have doubt as to who did this to Nikki. 
When the news came out about who did this, he made me sick when I saw him. He looked like a monster. On February 19th, 2018, George Birch goes on trial for the murder of Nikki Vanderheiden. But when he finally takes the stand, what he says leaves the courtroom stunned. At trial, Mr. Birch's explanation for what happened was he met Nikki at the bar. They were getting along, flirting, having a good time. And he ended up bringing her back to her house where she resides with Mr. Dietrich. George said they were having sex in front of Nikki's house in his vehicle. And at some point, someone comes out, hits him over the head with a pistol, and knocks him unconscious. The next thing that I remember was literally waking up on the ground outside the truck. He wakes up and finds Nikki already dead on the ground and someone holding him at gunpoint. At that point, did you know who that individual was? Never seen him before in my life. Do you know who that individual is now? Now I do. Who was it? It was that Beecher. Investigators believe that 31-year-old Nikki Vanderheiden was brutally murdered by convicted felon George Birch. But at trial, George blindsides everyone by claiming that Doug Dietrich was the one responsible for Nikki's death. Mr. Birch in the courtroom was very arrogant, very pompous. His demeanor was that of, I'm innocent, and Doug did this. Mr. Birch advised us that Doug ordered George to drive the body to the farm field. George said that Doug had ordered him to carry Nikki's body into the field and drop it. George then said that at one point he was able to get into a struggle with Doug, push him away, and get back into the car and take off. He didn't come up with that story until he had a chance to look at all the evidence that was being filed against him. George's wild allegation forces detectives to dig deeper to prove his guilt. Part of the obstacles in this was disproving that Doug did it and show his movements from that morning and that night. During the investigation, we learned that Nikki had given Doug a Fitbit device as a gift. So we realized that Doug was wearing that Fitbit device during all our contact with him. So we're able to review the information on the Fitbit device when he was home, going to sleep, and waking up again. Based upon all the Google dashboard data that we had from George, we knew at what time he and Nikki arrived back to Doug and Nicole's residence. So we were able to look at Doug's Fitbit to show that at that time that George and Nicole were outside, Doug was sleeping and not, in fact, out murdering his girlfriend and disposing of the body. Back in court, prosecutors used the location tracking evidence to demolish George's story. The act of violence that Doug allegedly did to him did not add up with any of the other evidence that we had. None of us bought George's story in court. We all knew it was a joke and a fairy tale made up. I think Nikki just wanted to get home to her children, and I know she fought for her life that night. Now prosecutors put forth their theory of what really happened that night. What I believe happened is that there was some arguments between Doug and Nikki. I believe that Nikki did leave the sardine can pretty upset and ended up at Richard Cranium's bar about a half a mile away. She was intoxicated. She was by herself. She was emotional. She is very outgoing, personable person. So she'd be very easy for someone to prey upon. At some point, she meets George Birch. They get to talking. He offers Nikki a ride home. She accepts it. They end up in front of her house. I believe at that point, George thought he was going to get some action for taking a girl home and didn't expect her to start fighting. And that enraged Mr. Birch. 
It turns into a sexual assault. At some point, he strangles her with that phone cord that was found. She fell out of the vehicle. He continued to stomp on her back and her head, eventually killing her. And then loading her up in his vehicle, driving her to a field and disposing of her body, and then going home like nothing happened. This poor woman was absolutely brutally, brutally attacked and murdered in front of her own home where her baby lay sleeping. And the thought of what he did to her is beyond comprehension. After closing arguments, it didn't take very long at all for them to make a decision. The verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, George Stephen Birch, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide for murdering Nikki Vanderheiden, George Birch is sentenced to life in prison without parole. The true killer in this homicide came completely out of left field. I felt extreme relief for the family that someone was going to answer for this extremely heinous, horrific crime. He's going to prison for the rest of his life. That was music to our ears, but we still knew it wasn't going to bring our Nikki back. Nikki had three young children at home, one of which is a newborn. She had her entire life ahead of her and a lot of things to accomplish and a lot of friends and family that miss her. She was an incredible human being, a great mother, and she should be recognized as that. Despite the pain of Nikki's loss, her friends and loved ones are devoted to keeping her memory alive. My children and I, we celebrate her life every year on May 21st, and we talk about her, and we go to the cemetery. I love to remember Nikki dancing and smiling and laughing. I loved her laugh, it was so contagious. She was, just was always smiling. I love to remember her that way. A kind-hearted young woman, beloved by friends and family. Samantha always had a smile on her face. She loved people, and people loved her, and she loved her cats. Found bludgeoned and strangled in her own home. I noticed the uh, cable wrapped around her neck three or four times. Military people have used that knot fairly often. It was a square knot. Police explore whether her search for love took a deadly turn. He wanted to come over and see her, told her to be blindfolded, topless. She told me he parked in her driveway and just sat there. He fit that mode of being a stalker. Until a shocking discovery. We found that he was more than just a friend, that in fact he had been a lover. Reveals a killer no one saw coming. He was a very unlikely killer. He didn't fit the profile at all. I was in shock. Frankly, I'd never seen anything quite like this before. Wichita Falls, Texas, a former oil boom town that grew into a small city. Wichita Falls is a town of about 100,000 people, about 130 miles west of Dallas. It's quiet community. We're very uh, close-knit community. It does have a small town feel to it. It's not difficult to get to know just about everybody in town. But the town's sense of security is shattered on the morning of January 6, 2003, when police get a call from a woman who says she's just discovered her friend's lifeless body in the bedroom of her home. I was a rookie police officer, and we got this call that somebody found a body. And we rushed over to the scene. When he arrived, I remember seeing her friends, and they were very upset. The frantic couple tell the officer the deceased woman is 28-year-old Samantha Lazark. At this time, I still don't know what exactly is going on. I arrived 30 seconds to a minute after the first officer arrived. So uh, when he entered the uh, residence, I was right behind him. So we weapons draw. 
and we're clearing through the bottom of the house, the kitchen. We start going up the stairs and we got down the hallway to her bedroom. And that's when I realized we have a murder. The victim was kind of in a prone position. I noticed the pool of blood was around her head and I noticed the uh, cable wrapped around her neck uh, three or four times. I'd never seen a female that was murdered like this. This was my first time to actually see that, and it gets to you. We then proceeded to establish a crime scene. A few minutes later, detectives and forensics arrive. The victim had a ligature made of a coaxial cable tied and very tied around her throat. It was a square knot. There's a couple of places you learn knots like that. Military people probably use that knot fairly often. And so it told me that whoever killed Samantha was versed in the knot based on some training. The cable was not the only weapon used by the killer. There was a fire extinguisher a few feet away from her that had hair and blood on it. There was definitely blood at the back of her head, a lot of it. there were some handprint, ridge detail on the fire extinguisher that appeared to be in blood. It looked like there was some fingerprint detail even on the coax. A strangulation death has some up close and, and personal aspect to it. Based on what we saw, we thought there was a good chance the killer actually knew the victim. Detectives examined the rest of the room for any other clues. In the middle of the bed was a laser pointer. On top of the laser pointer was some blood spatter. So we figured that the pointer had to have been on the bed when the injuries occurred to the victim. And looking around the house in general, none of the windows were broken and all the doors were intact. Whenever you don't have forcible entry, your first thought is that it's someone that she knows. Police immediately begin the process of interviewing Samantha's neighbors. One of the neighbors had written down that a car with California tags was at Samantha's home on about January the 1st. The car from California had been seen five days prior, but a different neighbor noticed another suspicious vehicle less than 24 hours before Samantha was found dead. There was a 12-year-old young man who noticed a motorcycle at Samantha's home. He said it was red and black. And so the information about the motorcycle was noted. Soon, news of the murder reaches Samantha's loved ones. I just barely got to work when my husband calls and he tells me to come home. And uh, he said that someone had killed Samantha the night before. I went into instant shock. That's just not something you can comprehend. I mean, is this really happening? I got a phone call from a friend, and he told me to turn the news on. And her house was on the news with police tape all around it. I went numb. I fell to the ground. Because, I mean, Samantha, why would someone want to hurt her? Samantha Lazark grew up in the small town of Terrell, Texas and was the oldest of three children. Samantha had two brothers, Joe Jr. and Lance, he was the baby. And Samantha practically raised him when I could work. She was very responsible. She could cook, she could wash clothes, and she loved little kids and she loved elderly people. She was one of them late bloomers. She didn't really care that much about boys until she met John. Samantha married her high school sweetheart, John Lazark, at age 20. John, he went to school to be a refrigerator repairman, and Samantha worked at the grocery store, and her job was real important to her. I met her when I worked at Albertsons. And Samantha was everyone's favorite cashier. And you may be having a bad day, and she just make you happy. <laughs> she was very um, high-spirited. She loved her cats. She loved music, and she just loved her tattoos. Everything she had had a meaning. 
She had her fairies on both arms. Then she had one on her chest right here that was for John. It said, always in my heart. A devoted wife, Samantha was blindsided when after eight years of marriage, John left her for another woman. She just kept trying to make him happy, and she was so devastated when he left. Samantha picked herself up, and several months later, she began dating again. Samantha's confidence definitely changed. I think Samantha was just trying to have fun, get out back into the world, try new things. Who killed this vibrant and kind young woman, and why? To try to answer these questions, police interview the couple who found the body, Lori and Donnie Nieves. With Lori and Donnie, as they were the last ones in the home before the police arrived, we certainly needed to make sure that there was no information that would tie either one of them to the actual murder. Detectives start with Lori, who says she and Samantha were co-workers. Lori described herself as being a good friend of Samantha's, and she said Samantha didn't come to work, which was very unusual. She didn't answer the phone. Donnie had taken Lori to work that morning, and so he came back to get her and take her to Samantha's home to check on her. Lori said they knocked on the door and didn't get an answer, but the door was unlocked, and so they went in and looked around, and they went upstairs and found Samantha deceased. Investigators speak to Donnie next, and he confirms Lori's statement. Donnie characterized Samantha as being his wife's friend. He said that he was only there because he gave his wife a ride to go check on Samantha. Detectives ask the couple if they know anyone who would want to harm Samantha. Lori pointed her finger at Samantha's estranged husband, John Lazark. Lori said that John was upset with Samantha because she was about to and his health insurance coverage that she'd been paying for, and he had an injury that was going to be very expensive if he didn't have insurance. Investigators learned that this ongoing conflict had recently escalated. Lori said Samantha told her in the couple of weeks before the murder. Samantha and John argued about the health insurance, and John told her something to the effect of, I want to take everything you have away from you. And so that threat certainly raised a red flag for us and made us wonder if John Lazark had anything to do with this murder. Coming up, police unearth a hidden online world. Samantha signed up for one of the chat rooms. Her username was meowmix28. The information on the chat was pretty sexual in nature. I warned her plenty of times, watch who you're giving your address out to. And hunt a bold killer with sinister motives. The fact that he couldn't take no for an answer made us want to figure out exactly who he was. He pressured her to meet in person, and she said, what if you're a serial killer? There's only one person that could put the DNA and the fingerprints on the murder weapon until investigators close in on an unlikely suspect. He looked like a decent, clean-cut, all-American kid. One of the most evil human beings. I was seriously afraid that there would be another victim. Police are investigating the violent murder of 28-year-old Samantha Lazar. Detectives have learned that Samantha and her estranged husband, John, were in a bitter dispute. She had threatened to take him off her health insurance policy. And Samantha's friend said, you didn't make a threat at one point. That made us want to know more about John and the relationship with Samantha. Investigators learned the marriage had only ended six months prior. They asked those close to Samantha about what led to the breakup. Her best friend was going through a divorce, and Samantha, being the kind-hearted person she was, let her move in. Samantha noticed that her friend and John seemed to be a lot closer, perhaps, than what she was comfortable with. Finally, she asked them if they were having an affair, and they said, yeah, they were in love. I remember how upset she was. I mean, how else could you feel when your husband leaves you for your best friend? John moved out with his new girlfriend, but remained in Samantha's life. 
They were separated, but John would move back in with Samantha. When he kept moving in and out, it was hell because he wouldn't leave her alone. Samantha finally told John to move out for good so she could get on with her life. But John was still dependent on her health insurance. John, when he was 18, a car fell on him when he was working underneath it and messed up his back. He was really anxious about the insurance. Investigators bring John in to the station. During the interview with John Lazark, he said that he and Samantha had sorted out the insurance and that she was not going to terminate his health care coverage. John also denies that he threatened Samantha like her friend claimed. But as he talks, detectives notice a suspicious detail. He had some small injuries to his hands that we wanted to talk to him about. John explained that they cut his hands while moving a table. The night of the murder, John said that he was with his girlfriend and that she, in fact, confirmed his alibi. If I were in love with somebody and they killed somebody else, I may lie for them, but there wasn't anything to contradict what he said. We asked John for fingerprints and a, a sample of his DNA, and he agreed to do that. Police have nothing concrete to tie John to the murder. But before they let him go, detectives ask who he thinks might want Samantha dead. John Lazark told us that his estranged wife was uh, online dating. John said he told her it was risky. He might run into the, some dangerous people. Investigators set out to verify John's claim. We interviewed Samantha's friend, Lisa, and Lisa told us that she knew that Samantha was, in fact, online dating. Samantha told me one day that she signed up for one of the chat rooms. It was so new back then. She just made a username and started meeting guys. Her username was Meowmix28. It was her love of cats, and she was 28 years old. When she started meeting these guys online, I said, you don't know these people. You're not letting them come to the house, are you? And I could tell that she didn't want me to know because she knew it was going to upset me really bad. The computer forensics lab examined Samantha's conversations with people online making arrangements to meet people that, th that she'd uh, chatted with online. Investigators compare the messages with details of Samantha's dating life provided by her friends. Lisa told us that Samantha was dating a man named Chris, and she'd spoken with Samantha the evening of the murder, in fact, and that Chris was at Samantha's home visiting with her. I did not know Chris. I never met him. I know she really liked him and liked hanging out with him. She said Chris was over at her house that evening when she called me. I had bought her the latest season of Friends that was out on DVD, and she said, we're going to watch Friends. I'll call you tomorrow. And that's the last time I talked to her. Police determined that the call with Lisa around 6 PM was the last contact anyone had with Samantha. She was found dead the following morning just before 10 a.m. Because Chris was with Samantha shortly before she died, we really wanted to look at uh, to see who Chris was and where he was. Investigators search for Chris in Samantha's online chats. However, they find her most recent correspondence, only two days before the murder, is with a man who goes by the username, I am Elliot. I am Elliot said that he had recently lost his wife and Samantha said, well, I've recently lost my husband to my best friend. I am Elliot seemed very sympathetic to her in their, in their messages, and she seemed to respond to that. We weren't sure who I am Elliot was. Her conversations with I am Elliot had seemed pretty innocent, and there was no association with the name Chris, so the investigation went and moved on from there. Detectives dig deeper into Samantha's chats, looking for messages with a darker tone. So the forensic lab was able to retrieve a chat with somebody initial KS, and the information on the chat was pretty sexual in nature. This individual pressured her to meet in person almost immediately, and so that raised red flags about him. He wanted to come over and see her, told her to be blindfolded, topless. 
And ironically, she said, what if you're a serial killer? But in the end, she went along with it. Detective suspicion only grows when they realize the chat between KS and Samantha is dated January 1st, just five days before the murder. One of the neighborhood watch people had seen a Mercedes with California license plates on it that had been at her house January 1st. It had all of the signs that we were on the right track with this guy. So we ran the license plate number, and the tag came back to Christoph Slora. Could Christoph Slora, KS, be the Chris who was with Samantha just hours before she was found dead? Samantha's best friend said that the night she was killed, she was with somebody named Chris. So we said, hey, maybe this is the Chris that we're looking for. Three days after the murder of Samantha Lazark, police have linked her online chat to the owner of a car with California plates seen parked at her house just days before she was killed. The neighbor had written down the license plate number of Christoph Slora's car. Police believe that Christoph is the man behind the username KS. When we looked at the online chat between KS and Samantha, they were obviously involved with each other sexually. And as we were looking for a Chris, we were really interested in finding that person. Samantha did tell her friend that she was hanging out with a guy named Chris the night of her murder. Alarm bells ring when they dig deeper into their suspect's background. Christoph was stationed at Shepherd Air Force Base here in Wichita Falls. Christoph wound up being somebody that was in the military. There was a perfect square knot in the ligature that killed Samantha, and I've already thought that somebody, perhaps with a military background, knew that square knot. While officers are sent to bring Christoph in to the PD, detectives receive Samantha's autopsy report. The cause of death was a strangulation, and that the coax was the, the means. The report also shows significant blunt force trauma to the back of Samantha's head. I think it would be really hard to just strangle somebody with a cable, and I suspect that the fire extinguisher was used to incapacitate Samantha so that she couldn't fight back. There was no evidence found during the autopsy or any other testing that showed there was any kind of sign of a sexual assault. Forensic analysis of the murder weapons gives investigators hope that the killer will be identified. From the lab, we learned that the coax had, and that the fire extinguisher also had DNA from who we believed would be the killer. The evidence that came back from the lab was very powerful. Fingerprints were on both the weapons, so it's pretty clear that if we could find one person that matched all these pieces of evidence, that we had the person that commit this crime, not just beyond a reasonable doubt, but beyond any doubt. Armed with new insights into the murder, police head to the local Air Force base to look for their number one suspect. When we tracked down Chris Loro, we asked him if he would come in for an interview, and he agreed to do that. He admitted that he had had a sexual relationship with Samantha but they didn't have a whole lot else in common, and he said he hadn't seen her for some time. Investigators ask him to explain why witnesses saw his car outside Samantha's home on January 1st, just five days before she was killed. At that point, he did not have anything to do with her death or being over there the day of the murder. Police want to know where Chris was the night Samantha was killed. Chris Laura said that he spent the day with some friends at a batting cage and offered up the names of his friends. We followed up that information by interviewing his friends, and they assured us, in fact, Chris Laura had been with them during the day and into the evening that day. Detectives conclude that Chris Laura was not the Chris that Samantha was with when she called her friend at 6 p.m. But they can't rule him out as the perpetrator since the exact time of her death is unknown. Even though his alibi was pretty good, it wasn't airtight. And so Chris Laura provided prints and DNA sample for us. With no hard evidence against Chris Laura, he's free to go. 
four days after her murder, family and friends gather to lay Samantha to rest. Samantha's funeral, it was packed. It was full of people that loved her. It was beautiful. She had a really big funeral. It was just hard. Nobody should have to bury their child. And the, the way she died was so violent, and I couldn't stand the thought of what actually happened to her. I had to take all of her pictures down for a while. I just couldn't deal with it. The next day, detectives ask Samantha's friends if they know of any other men she may have been involved with and receive stunning new information. Lisa raised the name Donnie Nieves to somebody that she thought that had an affair with Samantha. Lori and Donnie Nieves were the last ones in the home before the police arrived. They found Samantha deceased. I was surprised because when we interviewed Donnie at the time, Donnie characterized his relationship with Samantha as being his wife's friend. But after the funeral, Samantha's friend Lisa said that Donnie was more than just a friend, that in fact he had been a lover. Lori was a good friend of Samantha's and also a co-worker. But Samantha told me that Donnie and her had a short, intimate relationship shortly before she was killed. Samantha definitely felt guilty about it. Once we realized that he had been a lover of Samantha's, we had to look at them more closely. He had not been forthcoming before about this affair, so it makes you suspicious that this person has something to hide, and maybe what they have to hide is they're involved in the crime. That is a red flag. It's been one week since 28-year-old Samantha Lazark was found bludgeoned and strangled to death in her home. Now, investigators have learned that Samantha had an affair with the man who discovered her body. When Donnie Nieves was first interviewed, he failed to mention that he had been intimate with Samantha. When we interviewed Donnie again and confronted him with the question, were you lovers with a victim? He admitted that he was, and that it had been a very brief, intense relationship. Detectives asked Donnie why he didn't tell them about the relationship before. He said he didn't want his wife to find out about this affair because he knew she wouldn't be happy about it. Had Donnie killed Samantha to keep her from telling his wife Lori about their affair? We kept digging into him and seeing if there's anything that would connect him to the murder. Donnie insists he did not kill Samantha and begs investigators not to tell his wife about his infidelity. We asked him if he'd give DNA and fingerprints, and he cooperated. Police let Donnie go, and while they wait for his DNA and fingerprint results, Investigators uncover another suspicious exchange with an online suitor in Samantha's chat room history. His username was Death Metal. Samantha formed a relationship with Death Metal based on their mutual enjoyment of that kind of music. The messages suggest the pair had been on several dates, but then something changed. From the correspondence, he thought that was a pretty good relationship. And then all of a sudden, without warning, she's told him she wanted to break it off. The relationship may have been over, but the man continued to send Samantha messages. The fact that Death Metal couldn't take no for an answer certainly made us want to look at him pretty close and figure out exactly who he was and interview him. Had the man been so enraged by the rejection that he murdered Samantha? Police asked Samantha's friend Lisa if she can help identify death metal. Samantha's friend Lisa said it was a guy by the name of Connor Days. Connor was the one that really got to her, made her nervous. I warned her plenty of times, like meeting people online, you know, watch your back, watch who you're giving your address out to, your phone number. And uh, he was the only one that really stands out in my mind that he, he scared her. He just wouldn't stay away. He left notes on her door, even though Samantha told Connor that she didn't want to have anything to do with him any longer. And that kind of freaked her out a little bit. 
Samantha told me one day he parked in her driveway and just sat there and she'd call me and she wouldn't know what to do. Connor would fit that mode of being a stalker, coming around the lady's house all times of the day or night. And that stalker profile is the one that can lead to someone being a murderer. Connor looked really good for this, only he wasn't a Chris. But Samantha had dated him shortly before the murder, and we certainly knew that we had to find him. Investigators tracked down Connor and bring him in for questioning. When we interviewed Connor Days, he was pretty nonchalant about the whole thing. He didn't seem to have a, a lot of interest in the fact that she was dead. And that was either, a, I absolutely didn't do this, or hey, I'm trying to throw you off, and we weren't sure which one it was. Police asked Connor why he wouldn't leave Samantha alone after she broke off the relationship. Connor admitted he kept coming back around even though she didn't want to see him any longer. And it wasn't until she pressed the issue that he actually left her alone. And so when asked for his whereabouts at the time of the murder, Connor said that he was home alone and he didn't have anyone else to substantiate that claim. And that's a problem. Connor was asked during the interview to provide a sample of his DNA and prints for us. With no hard evidence linking Connor to the murder, he is released. Three weeks have passed since Samantha was found dead, and investigators still haven't found the elusive Chris that was with Samantha the evening she was killed. There had been an awful lot of work done, and we still hadn't uh, solved the case. There was kind of a frustrated feeling that uh, the person hadn't been caught yet. As they await news of an arrest, those closest to Samantha struggle with the pain of losing her. The mental images, imagining her maybe crying out for her mom or her dad or even me, somebody to come help her. It just makes me sick knowing someone could do that. Like one of the most evil human beings. I couldn't grasp the thought that my daughter was gone and she wasn't coming back. One month into the investigation, police are running out of leads. But then they receive the forensic results they hope will blow the case wide open. When you get information about whose prints and whose DNA is on that coaxial cord that was around the throat, that's just the place where you work to be. There's only one person that could put the DNA and the fingerprints on the murder weapon, and that was the killer. It's been one month since Samantha Lazark was killed, and detectives have just received lab results from evidence found on the murder weapons. We had all these suspects and were able to obtain possession of DNA samples and fingerprints. Will the results match John Lazark, Samantha's estranged husband, Donnie Nieves, who had an affair with Samantha and also found her body, or one of her online suitors, Connor Dace or Christoph Slora? It did seem like we were on the brink of solving the case, but the results came back, and it did exonerate all these people. Investigators are stunned. The DNA and fingerprints don't belong to any of their suspects or even anyone in the police database. We were hoping for the match, and it's a little disheartening when you think maybe you've got something, and then it turns out not to be at all. I talked to the DA and uh, the lead detective, but I didn't know what to do. I was in shock. It did concern me that Samantha was never gonna get the justice that she deserved. With the investigation back to square one, police review all the evidence and statements they've collected so far in their hunt for Samantha's killer. While we were looking back through the notes, we remembered that there was a youngster in the neighborhood that said something about a motorcycle having been around the night that Samantha died. So, we asked the computer forensics people to look for the keyword motorcycle, 
and they came back with information that, in fact, I am Elliot, said that he had a motorcycle. When detectives previously looked at chats between Samantha and I am Elliot, they didn't find any red flags in the correspondence or any indication his name was Chris, so they moved on to other leads. Her conversations with I am Elliot had seemed pretty innocent, and during the correspondence, he told her he worked out at Metro Photo. Metro Photo was a camera shop in Wichita Falls. Investigators rushed to the store, hoping to locate their new suspect. The 12-year-old said the motorcycle's red and black. And we went by the camera shop, and there was a red and black Harley Davidson motorcycle. It was a, an aha moment, if you will. We ran the plates on the motorcycle. And we found out it did belong to a person named Christopher Kyle Russell. The tag came back to Chris Russell. And we said, ah, oh, Chris, aha. Uh -huh. It made it even a bigger aha moment for us. And uh, that's when we decided it was time to know more about Chris. And Chris Russell was enrolled at Midwestern State University here in Wichita Falls, taking uh, some criminal justice classes. He looked like he came from a good home, and he was a decent, clean-cut, all-American kid. His family was well-to-do, respected members of a large church here in town. And his profile was almost too good to be true. Our first interview with Chris was a trip to Metro Photo, where we went in and asked him to come with us, and he did. At the station, investigators begin by asking the 21-year-old if he was with Samantha on the night of her murder. He was polite, but he declined to give an interview. He was asked to give his uh, DNA samples and fingerprints, and he said he needed to talk to a lawyer before he did anything. Even though it's Chris's right to tell us no, maybe it's because he had something he didn't want us to know. So we served Chris the search warrant in order to obtain prints and DNA from him. As detectives wait for results, they continue to look into Chris Russell's past and discover he served in the armed forces. Chris had, in fact, been in the Marine Corps, but only for a matter of days. They sent him packing after they got a good look at him. That was a large red flag that the Marine Corps didn't want him. With Chris looking increasingly suspicious, what detectives discover next is chilling. In the chat between Chris and Samantha, he said that he had recently lost his wife. And we looked into this and found some, frankly, rather terrifying information. Investigators learned that Chris lived in the small town of Shadron, Nebraska, with his wife, Tara, who died only 10 weeks before Samantha's murder. It was a short time after she had passed away. One night, he packed up his belongings and moved back to Wichita Falls from Shadron. Police contact law enforcement in Nebraska for information about the death of their suspect's wife. Chris Russell's wife died under circumstances that at first uh, was real pneumonia. However, when the autopsy came back and there was noted some bruising on the neck, that tells me that probably wasn't pneumonia. That sounds to me like a strangulation. But by the time the autopsy information was released, Chris had already had his wife cremated and left the state. I think the original autopsy didn't go into enough detail for authorities to charge Chris with that murder. And now that she had been cremated, that was never going to happen. Police fear they have an emerging serial killer on their hands. Detectives obtain a search warrant for Chris's residence. Chris lived with his parents here in Wichita Falls. While we were executing the search warrant, we noticed in Chris's bedroom a photograph that we thought was Samantha, but that was his deceased wife, Tara. Chris Russell's wife died, and weeks later, Samantha's now dead, and she looks incredibly like Chris Russell's wife. Police uncover more disturbing clues in Chris Russell's bedroom. We found a book, and it was a book about knots. And had I not known that there was a square knot around Samantha's neck, it probably wouldn't have looked twice at that book. And we also found some laser pointers. 
The laser pointers found in Chris's bedroom were nearly identical to the one found at the crime scene. There wasn't actually a smoking gun found during that search warrant, but there were certainly bullets to load that gun with. Investigators seize Chris's computer and confirm that he's the man behind the username, I am Elliot. But as they start reviewing his chat logs, police discover another troubling detail. We found that Chris, not only was he seeing Samantha, but he was seeing another young lady in Wichita Falls as well. Fearing that their killer could strike again, police rush to track the woman down. I was terrified about her. I was seriously afraid that she would be another victim in what looked like a continuing pattern from Chris Russell. Police investigating the murder of Samantha Lazark have learned that their prime suspect's wife died under suspicious circumstances and believe that his new girlfriend is in grave danger. I was worried he would do something else again. This nice young lady has no idea what she's involved with. We were certainly worried that she might be another victim in this case. Detectives locate the woman and inform her that Chris is under investigation. She was surprised to, to find that Chris perhaps was involved with the murder here in Wichita Falls. When we interviewed her, she said that Chris had brought her a DVD of friends to her home and that it was opened when, uh, when she got it. Investigators believe it's the same DVD Chris had watched with Samantha on the night of her murder. Samantha told her friend Lisa that she and Chris had watched that DVD of Friends at her home. But when we searched the, the crime scene at Samantha's house, the Friends DVD was not there. With the evidence against Chris growing, police receive his DNA and fingerprint results. In the end, there was only one person with DNA and fingerprints on the murder weapon, and that would be who killed Samantha, and that was Chris Russell. We arrested him at work. As I recall, he didn't seem surprised we were there at all. In fact, he didn't have anything to say about it. At trial, prosecutors put forward their theory about how the murder unfolded. The day of the murder, they were having a nice Sunday afternoon together and went out to her house, and her friend Lisa talked to her on the phone, and things were still going good when he was there, evidently. Maybe Chris brought her a laser pointer so that she could play with her cats. Then something happened that caused him to be angry. The first thing was a surprise attack from behind because the bruises were all on the back of her head. And he knocked her to the floor. At that point, the coaxial cable was in connection with the television set, and he had evidently ripped it out, which indicated a person who was very angry. And she's desperately trying to fight him off. At the same time, he starts looping that coaxial cable around her throat once, twice, and then a third time. And then he ties the knot there, and all the time she's getting weaker as blood is flowing out of her body. Then he strangles the life out of her. With no confession from Chris, no one knows his motive for murdering Samantha. You'd always like to know exactly what happened at the Lazark home that night, but something caused him to decide that he was going to kill her that night. The jury finds Chris Russell guilty, and the judge gives him the maximum sentence of 99 years in prison. There was an overwhelming sense of relief that we had taken somebody from society and put them someplace where they weren't going to harm anybody. And that's that big, deep sigh you get when you know in your heart that you did a good job. When you look at Chris Russell at first glance, you see a nice, clean-cut young man who was going to college to better himself and who was a regular churchgoer. He was a very unlikely killer. He didn't fit the profile at all. Well, I guess what we should take away from a case like this is that we need to take caution. When we meet people online, you can't be too careful. An investigation is later opened into the death of Chris Russell's wife, but no charges have been laid. 
For Samantha's family and friends, the pain of losing her will never go away. I want my daughter back, which I know it's, you know, not ever going to happen. She was special. She really was. She loved everybody. And she loved her mama the best. But I just, I don't know what to say. I don't know. We can't get her back. That day, Chris took my best friend, an amazing person, a person that can never be replaced in your life. I know she's watching down on me. I know she tries to protect me. And Samantha inspired me to definitely not take things for granted and to just live each day, make it the best I can. She's just made me a better person. A beloved mother of four and high school teacher. All of her students loved her, every single one of them. Plus a very special person. I always wanted to be more like her. Is found murdered, her body dumped miles from home. As I got closer, you could see the outline of the body. I've seen quite a few homicides and this one was very brutal. It felt very personal. Investigators try to piece together a mysterious crime. Law enforcement believed there was a violent struggle within the bedroom. He said that he did not hear this vicious attack that was taking place within feet of where he was sleeping. How could you not hear what was going on? Until the case takes a jaw-dropping turn. He was crying. He was emotional and said that he had a gun to his head. And leads to a killer no one suspected. I can't even fathom what goes through someone's mind when they do something like this. It was disturbing, very disturbing. Olney, Texas, a tiny rural town with a proud history in aviation. Olney, Texas was the home of air tractor. Crop dusting aircraft, they build them there. It's a very small town, very close-knit. Pretty much everybody knows everyone. It's an open door community. Doors are unlocked, people are very welcoming. On a warm summer morning in 2019, a terrible discovery shakes residents to their core. The Young County Sheriff's Office received a call of a missing person and the Olney Police Department was dispatched to the call. Just before 10 a.m., officers arrived to find homeowner Peter Allen and his two children, Kiara and Darian. Peter tells police he's worried something terrible has happened to his wife, 49-year-old high school teacher, Manu Allen. Peter told me that his wife was missing and that he had found a large amount of blood in their bedroom. And Peter told me that his wife's vehicle was gone. Investigators head to the bedroom and are shocked at what they find. As I got to the hallway, we started seeing signs of blood on the walls, uh, most notably what looked like a handprint. And as we started going into the bedroom, we noticed there was a large pool of blood at the end of the bed and the knife on the floor. One of the things that we also noted in the bedroom is that there were no sheets on the bed, which seemed odd. There was blood splatter across the furniture, the mattress, the closet doors. And as we proceeded into the garage, we could clearly see drag marks. As we were in the kitchen, we did see what appeared to be a footprint. Uh, a picture started to develop that something very bad had happened. As forensics begin processing the scene, police notify the DA's office. My uh, assistant district attorney, Philip Gregory, and I went out to the crime scene. The carpets were pretty much soaked in blood. There was a lot of uh, cast off blood on the walls and on the doors, and it was, a, it was a horrific scene to see. With that amount of blood, we were concerned that you're probably dealing with somebody who was, is deceased if they had not already made it to a hospital. 
With no sign of the missing woman, investigators asked the family for more information about Manu Allen. My mom was from a little village in southern Germany. She had uh, eight siblings. In the middle of my mom's college career, she came over uh, to America to learn the language better. And my dad had seen her walk by, and my dad was like, ooh, who's that? <laughs> and while she was in America that summer, they spent, like, every day together. Manu married U.S. Army veteran Peter Allen in 1996, and soon after, the couple moved to Kroll, Texas. I came to know Peter and Manu when I was appointed police chief in Kroll, Texas, and Peter and I became good friends, and there was never no doubt uh, that Peter and Manu loved each other very much. Manu and Peter eventually settled in the small town of Olney with their four children. My mom was a very supportive woman, but she was always pushing us to do our best. Manu was one of the most respected teachers at Olney High School, teaching English and German. All of her students loved her, every single one of them. And my mom, she'd always be one to joke with the kids. Even my friends, she would help them if they needed help with their homework after school. Now, the loving wife and mother has gone missing. Police asked Peter Allen the last time he saw Manu. The night before, he and his wife sat down on the couch, watched TV, and then he went to sleep on the couch, and she retired to the bedroom to go to sleep. Peter claims that no one noticed any sign of trouble until the morning. According to Mr. Allen, his daughter, Kiara, had woke up. I believe that she needed to get some laundry done when the laundry room is through the parents' room. Um, she noticed that there was some blood in the hallway area and concerned about her mother. Um, she went and woke up Mr. Allen on the couch. At that point, according to Mr. Allen, Mr. Allen went with her to investigate. He said that when he saw the knife, he drew the conclusion that she may have just been injured and cut but clearly seeing the scene, a cut would not have produced the amount of blood, and it was very apparent that somebody was either severely injured or deceased. Peter tells officers that he and Kiara went to the local hospital to look for Manu. It did seem that it was out of place the way that Peter went to the hospital first uh, before calling law enforcement. There seemed to be a lack of emotion he was very calm. So I pulled Officer Clark aside and I, I advised him. I said, we need to be very careful how we talk and handle Mr. Allen because he's potentially involved. Law enforcement believed there was a violent struggle within the bedroom. Mr. Allen was arguably within feet of the actual act occurring. There were two children that were inside the house too. And investigators were concerned that, hey, uh, how could you not hear what was going on? Peter and his two children are brought to the police station for further questioning. Meanwhile, officers are dispatched to nearby parks and wooded areas to look for Manu's car, a white SUV. In the morning, a neighboring county deputy, Wilk, from Archer County arrived, and uh, he knows the Allens. My oldest son, Wyatt, she was his teacher, and he thought the world of her. When I came through town on Main Street, I saw crime scene tape up around the Allen's house. And in only you don't see crime scene tape up around houses that often. As a typical law enforcement officer, he says, hey, what can I do to help? I was asked to go out to Lake Cooper, look for a white SUV. I was given the license plate number. And when I pull into Lake Cooper and I go around to where the boat ramp is, I could see a white SUV on the other side of the lake where the dam is. So I got out, started looking at the vehicle, and activate my body-worn camera, take photos of the car, and I had noticed some brown smears on the car. And I thought, this looks like dried blood. So after I had photographed the car and the area around the car, I started looking around. So I took off walking towards the fence line. I looked to my left, and I could see a pile of clothes or blankets and as I got closer, you could see the kind of the outline of the body wrapped up in these sheets and blankets. 
I felt the body, it was cold to the touch, rigor had set in. I had my body camera going. And I think on my video camera, you can hear me take a, a deep sigh because I know that the Allens are gonna get notified that their mother has been killed. We received a phone call from Mr. Wilk. I got a dead body out here at Lake Cooper. Uh, that he had located the vehicle in a body. Well, I mean, we have a whole crime scene back there at the, the house. When we first arrived at the lake, you could see a outline of a white sheet um, over by the fence line. Police confirm the deceased woman is Manu Allen. Miss Allen had been stabbed multiple times and a lot of stab wounds were to the head. I've seen quite a few homicides and this one was very brutal due to the amount of violence that was involved and the care taken in the way that she was moved and, and placed at the lake. It felt very personal. That started leading us to believe that it was somebody that knew her. Coming up, suspicion falls close to home. She had picked up the knife that was in the bedroom. He said he heard something in the middle of the night. Causing rumors to swirl through a small town. Everybody knows everybody. A lot of accusations started going around. I said, I need you to look me in the face and tell me. Did you have anything to do with this? And investigators uncover new clues. It was a communist block pistol, and it was semi-automatic. Until a stunning admission leaves a family devastated. It was just a shock that he confessed. It was a nightmare. The body of missing teacher and mother of four, Manu Allen, has just been located at Lake Cooper, a recreational area a few miles from her home in Olney, Texas. I'd been to homicide scenes before, but when you find somebody that you knew and your kids knew, when I did go home and told my kids that, hey, I was your teacher that was killed, that was hard. Olney, Texas is the small community where you don't expect this sort of violence at all. There had not been a murder there in the last 10 years. As they continue their investigation, detectives examine several items of evidence, trying to piece together what happened. The vehicle had turned down a little offshoot. It was approximately 20 feet from the road, and whoever was driving the vehicle had tried to turn the vehicle around and got high centered. Police believe that after the SUV got stuck, Manu's body was removed from the car. The body was found within sight of the vehicle, and there had been yucca leaves placed around the facial area. If you have a body where the eyes or the face are covered, it typically means that the person who has been involved in the death somehow knew this individual. When a killer does this type of behavior, it's because they're trying to show some sense of respect to the deceased. Forensics process the body and collect fingerprint evidence from Manu's vehicle. There were fingerprints that were located on the car that were in blood. When you find these, it's the you can say the golden ticket uh, for law enforcement uh, because whoever was involved in this left their signature behind. Another detail in the field grabs detectives' attention. There was a bicycle track that was leaving from the area of the vehicle onto the main road. Is it possible the killer had perhaps left on a bicycle? It being a recreational area, there is the potential that it could have been just a person riding through the area, but you're going to collect as much information as you can. Investigators catch a break when they find a witness who supports their discovery. There was an oil field worker that worked on the road that comes right out from the lake heading into Olney, and he happened to see very early in the morning someone on a bicycle wearing dark clothes with a backpack heading towards Olney from the lake area. While officers are dispatched to track down the cyclist, detectives inform Peter that his wife's body has been found and closely watch his response. Mr. Allen 
His emotional reaction uh, was a little different than what you would expect. Mr. Allen was extremely detached, emotionless. He said that, you know, he wanted to get justice for Manuela and that he had multiple firearms and a lot of ammunition that he could bring to bear if he didn't figure out who had done this and that he was going to do what the military had taught him to do. As a law enforcement officer, I get mixed messages from that. When you start saying that you're going to go after whoever did it, you have to wonder if he's trying to point the investigation in a different direction than on him. Based on the crime scene, detectives believe that Manu was killed in her bedroom and removed from the home in the early morning hours. They want to know how this could have happened with Peter in the next room. Mr. Allen said that he had been drinking vodka, and then typically, if Mr. Allen had been drinking, he would not sleep in the same bed as Miss Allen. Mr. Allen said that it was common for him to sleep on the couch because he snored a lot. Peter claims the only time he woke up was around dawn when he thought he heard his wife's car starting. He heard it, and he didn't think anything of it. Mr. Allen indicated that it's not his job to check on where she's going. And he apparently went back to sleep. Police want to know how he heard a car start, but not his wife being attacked just feet away. Obviously, there was a violent struggle within the bedroom, and uh, Mr. Allen was uh, within shouting distance, hearing distance of the struggle. Mr. Allen had talked about how the incident may have occurred and that struggles can be silent and that that might be a reason why he didn't hear what had happened. That's another cause for concern for law enforcement when you've got a suspect with a potential explanation for every possible fact. Wondering how the killer escaped in Manu's car, investigators ask where she kept her car keys. Mr. Allen, he indicated that those keys were not kept in the bedroom. They were kept in kind of a common area in the kitchen. When asked why anyone would want to kill his wife, Peter has a theory. During the interview with Mr. Allen, he had indicated that it was well known that he had a large gun collection and he had spoken to a lot of people about it. Mr. Allen was concerned that someone was breaking into the home to steal his gun collection. Police are skeptical as they found no signs of forced entry and were not aware of any stolen items. When as a law enforcement officer, I felt that Mr. Allen might be trying to steer the investigation. He had been drinking vodka that day. He was feet away from where the murder had occurred. He was very concerned about things that in my mind would not be of importance from somebody that had just lost their wife. So that made him rise to the top as a potential suspect. Detectives believe that before Manu Allen's body was dumped at a nearby lake, she was stabbed to death in her bedroom while three family members were in the house. But her husband, Peter, insists he detected no sign of trouble. Peter Allen, Manu's husband, said that he did not hear this vicious attack that was taking place within feet of where he was sleeping on the couch. Skeptical of Peter's version of events, police want to speak with his children, Darian and Kiara, to see if they witnessed or heard anything. They start with his 15-year-old daughter, Kiara. She said she was out with her boyfriend and that her father uh, let her in the door around 11.30 that evening. Her bedroom is where she went, which was right next door to her mother's room. She had put earbuds in her ears and had a phone call with a friend of hers and uh, fell asleep with those in her ears. Kira said that she never heard any screams or anything that alerted her that something bad was going on in the home. Kira said she woke up that morning and she was trying to get to some clothing that she had washed and the layout of the house would have required her to go through the master bedroom into the utility room, but the door was locked. And she said, uh, Dad, the door's locked and I'm seeing blood over here. And that woke him up rather quickly. 
She said he asked her to go around to the other door in the garage and try to get in, but then when she did, she was met with just, the, you know, the scene of the blood in the bedroom and everything else. Here I did walk through the bedroom, and she did touch some items of evidence. She had picked up the knife that was in the bedroom to examine it. She said that she did not see any blood or anything on it. Of course, picking up any kind of evidence is concerning. It leaves her information on the knife. Investigators next interview Peter and Manu's 20-year-old son, Darian. He said that he arrived back at the house at about 11.45 and then just went up to his bedroom. He said, I was playing a video game pretty much the whole night through, so I had my headphones on. Darian said he had not heard anything other than he heard something in the middle of the night, but he just thought it was his father in the kitchen getting something. According to Darian, he didn't find that unusual, so turned his attention back to his game. There were three family members that were in the house. It was difficult for me personally to believe that they could not know that something serious is going on in, in a bedroom that's within, you know, 20 feet from you. I, I can't explain that. When you have all these people in the home when this occurred, you have to rule them out individually. Fingerprints and footprints can either rule people out or you can rule somebody in. And unfortunately, it's not like watching a crime TV show where the case is figured out in 15 minutes. It might take months to get returns on some of these items. Peter and Manu's other children, 21-year-old William and 18-year-old Melanie, arrive at the police station anxious for news about their mother. They wouldn't let us see my dad. Probably after like five hours of waiting, they finally let my dad in and then my dad told us that they found her body. It was a nightmare. At the time of the murder, Melanie Allen, the older daughter, was actually at Six Flags that evening, and they never returned home that night. William Allen, the oldest son, was a student at Tarleton State University, and he was in Stephenville the whole time. Both William and Melanie insist they have no idea who would want their mother dead. I didn't think anyone would have a single thought about hurting my mom. You have to talk to the children, naturally, to see if they can um, give you any idea of other uh, red flags or things that might have been going on in the home. Investigators were concerned about simmering unresolved conflict that may have led to a murder. But when the children were interviewed, uh, none of them ever described seeing uh, Mr. and Ms. Allen having any kind of a noteworthy fight. Police tell the Allen family that they're free to go, but they can't return home until forensics finish processing the house. The next day, there was a lot of evidence that was collected. The investigators took fingerprints, footprints, in addition to the uh, handprints that were on the wall leading back towards the bedroom. Detectives zero in on an interesting detail. It appeared that the perpetrator had left the bedroom and had gone into the kitchen to specifically retrieve something because there were not that many footprints in that kitchen. And the footprints went straight to where the keys to the vehicle were kept. So whoever had done this knew where they kept the keys. 48 hours into the investigation, the autopsy report provides chilling new insights into Manu's last moments. The autopsy revealed that Manu Allen had sustained roughly 47 stab wounds, the majority of which were to her, her head. She did have some defensive wounds on her hands. However, it wasn't the stab wounds that proved fatal. She also had suffered strangulation and a great deal of force had been used, so much so that portions of the neck had been broken. The autopsy report contains one final insight into the killer's brutality. They did find a post-mortem gunshot wound in her facial area. 
If you look at the totality of what happened with Miss Allen, the stabbings, the choking, and then finally the bullet, we knew we needed to get this suspect caught as soon as possible. Two days after Manu Allen's murder, detectives have learned that in addition to being viciously stabbed and strangled, she was also shot once in the face. There was a post-mortem gunshot fired at the lake after the body was moved to where her final resting spot was. There was a bullet casing that was recovered from that particular area and the actual bullet. Police bring this new evidence to the crime lab hoping to identify the gun used to shoot Manu. As people in the town of Olney await news of an arrest, rumors start to fly in the close-knit community. There's a group on Facebook called Rants and Raves, and you will hear whatever is on somebody's mind about anything that's going on in town. And a lot of people were very hard on the Allen family. It was really tough waiting for answers because other people in the town all wanted to point fingers at my dad. People looked at him differently. They would look at all of us differently. Everybody knows everybody. A lot of accusations started going around. A lot of discussion about Mr. Allen's past, his prior military. Uh, a lot of people felt that uh, Mr. Allen was potentially involved in the homicide of his wife. His children stand by him, but some of Peter's friends doubt his innocence. When I'd heard that Manu had been killed, I'm instantly thinking car wreck or something. So I called Peter's phone. And we hadn't, hadn't spoken in quite a few years. Melanie answered. And I said, Melanie, what's going on over there? She said, well, mom's been murdered. So I told her, I said, I'm on the way. I had some concerns about Peter and uh, his military background. Peter, uh, from time to time, drank hard liquor. I'd never seen him violent, but my thought was maybe something had snapped. Maybe there had been infidelity in the family or something. When I got there, I said, Peter, I need to know now. I need you to look me in the face and tell me, did you have anything to do with this? He looked me square in the face nose to nose and says, I had nothing to do with this role. You know I couldn't do it. And it led me to think, who could have done this? It was disturbing. Detectives get a fresh lead when they receive new information on the cyclist seen leaving the area where Manu's body was dumped. The day that um, the body was found, an oil field worker around 6 o'clock in the morning, he saw a person headed from Lake Cooper riding back towards Alney on a bicycle. The local bank had uh, security cameras on the outside of it, and a surveillance video showed somebody riding in town on a bicycle dressed up in shorts with a backpack. The video footage that was received from the bank, it was from a distance, so you were not able to see a face for identification purposes. You could see it was a younger person. It was definitely the person that everybody was wanting to talk to, but we did not know who that person was. The quest to identify the suspicious cyclist hits a dead end, and pressure continues to mount on the police. The community's in a lot of pain. We were kind of in a situation where we can say, hey, we're investigating this, we have leads, we're working on them. Please be patient with us. As police await analysis of the bullet and casing found at Lake Cooper, they call Peter back to the PD and ask him about his gun collection. Peter Allen had told us that he had weapons and ammunition in the house and that they were stored in his bedroom in a closet. Peter tells investigators not all of his guns are locked in the safe. He also keeps a loaded pistol in a dresser drawer. It was a communist block pistol that would have been from like the Soviet Union and it was semi-automatic. Police never found this gun when they searched the house. Had the killer stolen it? or had Peter staged it to look this way. It felt as if Mr. Allen was trying to lead the investigation, but uh, investigators are naturally gonna start looking at other 
firearm thefts or burglary cases that have occurred in the area. Investigators look into recent gun thefts around town. Corey Taylor was a local kid there that uh, had been in trouble, and it was learned that uh, just before the murders had occurred, he had been involved in a burglary that involved firearm theft. Had Corey entered the house to steal Peter's guns and killed Manu in the process? Mr. Allen had a maybe over 100 firearms in the house, so that became a potential motive for the killing. So we go to Corey Taylor's house. When I got to his apartment, Corey came to the door and told him that I was there so that he could be interviewed about the murder of Miss Allen. Corey indicated that he did know Miss Allen from school. Officers asked Corey for his whereabouts the night of the murder. His alibi was totally void of having any contact with the Allen family residence whatsoever. As Corey speaks, Officers see something suspicious. I noticed a bicycle, and the tire mark from the bicycle it looked very, very similar to the tracks at the lake. It had the exact tread that was seen out at the lake close to Manu's body and the vehicle. So a red flag went up there. Detectives working the homicide of Manu Allen have noticed a suspicious bike in the apartment of 17-year-old Corey Taylor. Could Corey be the cyclist from the surveillance video? One of our investigators was able to see a bicycle, and he's actually able to take a photograph of the treads on it, and everybody was kind of like, oh, that's probably the bicycle we're looking for. Mr. Taylor denied that it was his, but he can indicate that the bicycle was actually owned by a guy named Julius Mullins. Corey Taylor said that his friend Julius Mullins had dated Manu's daughter, Melanie. Detectives are curious if Corey is trying to deflect blame. They press Corey for more information about his friend, Julius Mullins. Julius was a running back for the Olney football team, and so as far as the community, he was, he was known. Julius Mullins was well-liked by the other team members. He seemed to have some success on the field, but Julius Mullins did not always have the best home life. Julius didn't have a stable home. I know his relationship with his parents were strained. He had stayed with Corey Taylor some, as well as the um, high school gym, because the coaches had allowed him to stay there because he did not always have a, a place to stay. Police learned that Julius knew Manu from school and had dated her daughter, Melanie, for a year. He, he was a good person. My mom was extremely kind and accepting of Julius. She would help him with his homework. One time, he got kicked out of his house, and she let him even stay the night. Despite Manu's love and support, Julius's behavior had changed in recent months. Things just started going downhill. He just started doing worse and worse in school. He started getting in more fights with his parents. Uh, him and I started getting in more fights. And I finally left him probably six, seven months before what happened. Police bring Julius in for an interview and notice some alarming details. Julius Mullins he had some cuts and scrapes on his arms and legs, which would be consistent with someone who had been out by Lake Cooper. There were a great deal of yucca and cactus plants, and you couldn't have gone through that field without getting scratched up by the shrubbery. Mullins had indicated that the night of the murder that he had went to a party with several other people. After the party, he said he went to Corey's apartment and crashed for the evening, but he had not seen Corey that night. So the alibi was pretty weak. Julius Mullins admitted that he owned the bike that was at Corey Taylor's home. The bike places Julius Mullins out at Lake Cooper where the body had been left because those tire tracks match that bike perfectly. So with any murder investigation. The interviewers in these cases are going to press 
pretty hard to get to the information. Detectives asked Julius for more details about his alibi and the injuries on his arms and legs. As they're finding inconsistencies in the stories, they're going to start breaking these stories down and get him to eventually just tell the truth. He was crying. He was emotional. And Mullins finally admitted that he had killed Miss Allen. At that point, Mullins started giving the information that was pertinent and, and matched what we had found at the scene. Julius tells police he had gained entry to the Allen home through a faulty garage window. Mullins accessed the garage and went into the uh, bedroom of Miss Allen. I believe Miss Allen was surprised uh, when Mullins started the assault. He continued to assault her and she fought for her life. Mullins stabbed her multiple times and then eventually choked her to death. He then took the sheets off the bed, wrapped her up so that he could move her. Police believe Julius then found Peter's Soviet-made pistol in the dresser drawer and headed to the kitchen to grab Manu's car keys. He then drug her through the laundry room, through the garage, through the backyard, out to the alley, and loaded Miss Allen into the car. He loaded his bicycle into the car with him, and he drove her to the lake. Julius planned to hide the body far from the road, but the vehicle got stuck on the rough terrain. So he put together a hasty plan and pulled her out and drug her to a fence. He then took the gun and fired one shot, hitting her in the face to ensure that she was dead. And then he took his bike and he fled the scene. It was a sigh of relief in some respects that he confessed. Mullins did indicate that he was still in love with Melanie and was upset about that. We asked him why he would want to kill uh, the woman he loves, mother. And Mullins said that, that he had a, a gun to his head. According to Mullins, on the evening before the murders had occurred, he said that he had gone to Alsop's and had run into Peter Allen in the store. And Peter had him come outside into to Peter's car. And Peter had pulled a gun on him and pressed it to his chest and told him to kill Miss Allen and that if he did not do it, that his whole family would be killed. He said that was the reason for committing the murder. Julius Mullins has confessed to the murder of Manu Allen but claims that he was forced into it by her husband, Peter. Mr. Mullins gave very specific information about them meeting at a, an Allsup's convenience store where Mullins said Mr. Allen pretty much just uh, pulled him into his car and said, hey, you're going to do this. Otherwise, I'm going to go kill all your family. When Mullins made these accusations toward Mr. Allen, Mr. Allen was still a person of interest. Police try to verify the alleged meeting between Julius and Peter. We were able to secure the phone records of Julius Mullins and back to the day that uh, Mr. Allen supposedly threatened Julius into murdering his wife and were able to determine that Mr. Mullins' phone was nowhere near that Ossip's location at any time that day. Police interviewed Julius again to clarify his allegations against Peter. He insists he's telling the truth and provides more shocking details about the murder. He said that after Miss Allen was dead, that Peter assisted him in wrapping the body and pulling her out to the alleyway and then loaded her into the car. Detectives receive forensic results and check if Julius's account matches the evidence. There were some bloody handprints and some fingerprints, and they had footprints that they had sent to the crime lab, and they were eventually identified. Forensic testing determined two people had left footprints in the kitchen. One set was left by Julius. Julius had been in the home uh, frequently when he was dating Melanie, 
and the footprints went straight to where the keys to the vehicle were kept in the kitchen, and Julius would know that. Investigators wonder if the other prints belong to Peter, but the results show otherwise. Kiara left footprints, but she said that she had stepped in the blood, so that lined up with what she had said had occurred. The crime lab also determines fingerprints left in Manu's blood in the house and on her car belong to one person. Sure enough, they belong to Julius Mullins. We were able to rule Peter Allen out. The things that Mullins attempted to implicate Peter in, the physical evidence did not support that. The cell phone data did not support that. The results were confirmation that Mr. Allen had nothing to do with this. Avery Mark. Manu was my life. She was my soulmate. And I don't think any human being alive could expect for the heart, the soul, the core of the family to be murdered um, without reason whatsoever. I knew they were going to look at me because I was a husband and I was in the house. When the police made the arrest, there was disbelief. I just didn't think he had it in him to do something like that. On July 15th, 2019, 18-year-old Julius Mullins is charged with the murder of Manu Allen. My daughter Melanie dated him, and uh, Julius would come over. My wife was very kind to Julius, but we were both nice to him. I was not worried about Julius at all while they were dating. He seemed more like a pleasant young man. With Julius in custody, police find Peter's stolen pistol at the home of Corey Taylor. They did investigate Corey Taylor, but he was ruled out. No fingerprints, no footprints, no DNA, nothing. The sole perpetrator of the crime was Julius Mullins. Police believe the knife found at the scene may have been dropped by Julius, but forensic analysis found it was not used in the murder. Staff at the school had found Mullen's backpack with a knife that was eventually determined to have been involved in the murder of Miss Allen. Tragically, no one in the house heard Julius's vicious attack on Manu. Kira put earbuds in her ears and fell asleep with those in her ears. Darian was upstairs playing video games with a headset on. And then Mr. Allen, he'd had consumed alcohol, and that might have contributed to him sleeping heavier than uh, normal. Julius Mullins was charged ultimately and pled to murder in the first degree. And he also pled to the abuse of a corpse. Julius receives a 55-year prison sentence. I can't even fathom what goes through someone's mind when they do something like this, especially to someone who has been so kind to them. I was totally shocked that it was a person that had been trusted in their home. Uh, it was a person that Manu had assisted with tutoring and personal family issues that were going on with them. Was robbery the motive? Was revenge the motive? I don't think we'll ever know. Um, unless Mullins decides to tell us why he did what he did. The only thing I can think of is he felt that if he killed Melanie's mother, that it would break her heart. A twisted revenge is the only thing I can think of. It, it tore me apart. And my dad was, of course, completely torn apart. They were supposed to spend the rest of their lives together. I love to smile, I love to laugh, I love to make jokes, but I haven't laughed or smiled like I did with her and since it happened. There are generally two types of love. The one type is where you've been with somebody for a very long time, so you got that deep love. And then you got the other kind of love, which is the infatuation type love. And I had both of those for my wife. There is no such thing as moving on from it. I'm making progress, and my kids are making progress, but I'll never move on. That day will be stuck in my head until the day I die. I wanted to grow up to be just like my mom, because I saw that she 
was a strong, kind woman that helped everyone she could, and she was nice to everyone, no matter who they were. I miss how she was always pushing me to do my best. I really miss her support.